Uh, Amy Bomzi. Here. Stephen Bundy. Here. Kendra Basner. Here. David Carr. Here. Eric Deitz. Here. Andrew Dilworth. Here. Justin Fields. Here. Matt Hodell. Here. Toby Inlander. Here. Adam Koss. Here. Amber Lee. Here. Dina Roche. Here. Teresa Schmid. Here. Richard Solomon. Here. Stephen Sparta. Here. Marshall Whitney. Thank you. Okay, any comments from the public? Hearing none, we'll move on uh, to staff report. Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, I have a few items to report uh, this morning, but I will try to um, move it quickly. If you have any questions, please uh, stop and, and ask along the way. Uh, the first one, uh, is inconsequential, but uh, I should alert you. I got to leave early today, um, so never fear. Mimi will be here uh, to guide you um, through the end of the meeting. But I may have to leave around two thirty or three to catch an earlier flight for a family event back home. Um, more substance, uh, more important to the substance of uh, your work and what you all care about is that. Uh, Adels, uh, the task force is meeting um, next Thursday here in LA, uh, February 28th. The meetings are webcast, so if you're interested or in the area and wish to attend or follow along, we encourage you to do so. Um, in fact, uh, the task force will be considering uh, ABA Model Rule 5.7, which is much the focus of our ancillary uh, business opinion um, that we'll be discussing today. Um, Yeah, it's posted on there. Um, it's a, it's part of their agenda materials. The draft, the draft, our opinion. Oh, of our opinion, no, we have not shared our opinion. Um, Kevin Moore worked up a memo Is there any that I shared with why you. They shouldn't, why they shouldn't see it? Oh, your mic. Uh, no reason. We we could we could share it. I mean, the fact that an opinion already exists in almost final form that does what Moore describes. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think they're aware that an opinion is being worked on. They have not seen it. Um, and then, of course, when um, it goes out for public comment, we will certainly share it with them. Right, but it is a little weird because he goes on at length about maybe an ethics opinion would be a good idea. And it feels a little odd um, that he would mm -hmm. And it could go in all the nuances. Well, and we have an ethics opinion that goes into all the nuances already. So. Sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what time did you say that... Um, Meeting is it starts at 10 a.m. 10. 10 on Thursday, the 28th. Okay. Um, applications for appointment to this committee are available. Their March uh, 15th uh, deadline this year um, to submit those applications. So we encourage you to solicit uh, anybody you think would be interested and a strong member in participating on the committee to apply. And um, as you are aware, we'll be uh, assuming the uh, drafting of uh, arbitration advisories from the Committee on Fee Arbitration. So if you know anyone in particular that has what I would call a crossover background between ethics and fee arbitration, there are those folks out there. I know of them. So if you too know of them, I would encourage you to, uh, in particular, uh, ask those folks uh, to apply. We would really be looking for that type of background in the application process this year. Um, the board next meets on March 14th and 15th, and um, the committee, this committee has been asked uh, to provide input regarding the recommended size and composition of COPRAC going forward. Um, that item will be taken up by the board on March 14th and 15th, and so there's a, there's a specific item on the agenda today to solicit uh, this committee's uh, input staff is making a recommendation that this committee maintain a its size at, at 10 persons. But, um, you know, we welcome the committee's thoughts on what the appropriate size and composition of the committee is going forward. And uh, hopefully we'll have time to discuss that later today. Um, in preparing uh, for the board meeting, 
the 12005 opinion and 14003 uh, settling bef uh, before withdrawal um, was shared with uh, board members, uh, or at least the chair of RAD, um, to alert them that these items were coming uh, before RAD for approval at March. And uh, the chair of RAD had a few questions um, that he thought the committee should consider with regard to uh, the settling before withdrawal opinion. And uh, I've raised those questions with Amy and Drew, who are the remaining members of the drafting team. Uh, the uh, opinions not noticed on today's agenda, so we can't talk about it. Um, I wouldn't say it's anything um, major, um, but he just had a comment about um, uh, some aspect of the opinion. So uh, please be on the lookout for that opinion being noticed on uh, the April uh, meeting, in which we will uh, take his comments under consideration and see if we can um, uh, adjust the opinion accordingly. And uh, lastly, as I've reported previously, uh, Assembly Bill 1987, which discusses uh, attorney's responsibility with uh, how to maintain files during post-conviction uh, discovery issues, um, requests that uh, the State Bar study whether those obligations or duty duties are sufficiently uh, stated and explained in uh, the current rules of professional conduct. I'm sorry about my microphone. Um, and uh, as part of that um, meeting with the RAD chair and vice chair, they have assigned that assignment uh, to COPRAC. Um, Steve uh, Bundy has previously graciously volunteered um, to help uh, work on that assignment. But if there were, if there's anyone else um, who'd be willing to help um, I think a two-person team to take on that assignment could, could be helpful. You don't have to declare your interest right now. Um, I, uh, was a, uh, I volunteered to do research on what ethics opinions and uh, disciplinary case law has to say on that issue. I've completed my research, so I can say that there are two ethics opinions, um, which will help guide and inform uh, Steve and whoever else may wish to volunteer to assist them. Uh, and drafting up his report. And then um, the non-codified statutory language asks the State Bar to consider whether it would recommend either an ethics opinion or an amendment to the rules of professional conduct uh, to state clearly what a criminal defense lawyer or a prosecutor's duty is with respect to maintaining um, criminal uh, files, you know, post-conviction. Post um, and uh, that'll be what, what, what we'll be working on. Yes. 14.004. Yes, and 14.004 uh, is still out for public comment. That has a public comment deadline of next Wednesday, February 27th. The uh, comments we've received to date are included in your agenda materials, and um, we will take that up at the April meeting as well. Can I ask you a question about the um, 14 triple O microphone? Yeah, sorry. <clears throat> the 14 triple O three and the and what it what the process is. So a member of the board has a question, a substantive question about the opinion. Correct. We can't talk about it today to make any adjustment based on his suggestion because it's not on the agenda. So what's the procedure? So um, I can assign it. I can share those concerns with the drafting team. Uh -huh. um, and, uh, you know, I, I can report generally, uh, essentially, um, the opinion states and references a duty of honesty. Uh, the board member was concerned that that might be too broad. The rule seems to be more particularly focused on a duty of truthfulness, notwithstanding there's case law, which talks about generally uh, dicta, not holdings, about referencing a lawyer's duty of honesty. 6106 about, talks about not being dishonest, but um, he raises a, a, a good point that there is no quote unquote specific duty of honesty. Um, but it's not just um, changing the word uh, honesty to truthfulness throughout the opinion. That would be an easy fix and a non substantive fix. Uh, but he had an interesting question as whether the committee should consider in detail whether um, uh, where there's an opportunity that um, information 
um, was not available to the other side, but there was no uh, obligation to disclose that information or have made it available to the other side, could the lawyer still settle the case in that situation? Yeah, I, I just was asking a, a process question, which is, so like, let's assume that we all agree that Sean's comment, or, or we think we need to have a conversation about Sean's comment um, and, and whether we need to change the opinion. So does that mean that it won't, the board wouldn't consider it at their next meeting because we're gonna have to take it up again? Correct, it's not, re staff is not putting it before the board at their March meeting because a question has come okay. up. Okay, okay. Sorry, I didn't know that that was your question. That's okay. So, and so we'll put 14003 back on the agenda in April. We'll discuss the concerns that were raised. We'll see if changes need to be made and we'll make a conclusion and determination and then it would go back, it might go out for public comment again if the changes are substantive or it would go back to the board um, with our response requesting uh, approval for publication. Okay. Thanks. Sorry, I That's okay. totally blew past that one. <clears throat> okay, that is all I have to say this morning. Right. Um, okay, so I guess the next thing is to um, approve the minutes for last week's last month's meeting. So, does anyone want to make a motion? Thank you. Second. Wonderful. Uh, do we have to do roll call? That'll be great. Great. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so Drew uh, said he has a his flight is delayed. So I guess I was going to start with um, uh, twelve triple oh three the rate the webs the ratings website or the whatever it's the Avo opinion, um, but I won't because Drew's a part of that drafting team. Um, so I think, um, well, one thing is, have, have, can people just generally raise their hand whether they have, about whether they had an opportunity to read uh, the advising a marijuana business opinion? All right, pretty decent. Should we, the ones who didn't, would you like an opportunity to maybe look over it at lunch and we talk about it after lunch? Awesome. Sounds good. Okay, great. Um, all right, so we will do that. Um, so let's uh, start with um, uh, Dina, the opinion that Dina is the lead on, um, the ethical uh, opinions, obligations when departing a firm. Sorry, we, um, for the, yeah. Um, so, okay, so briefly, um, we, for those of you who are here that at the last meeting, we discussed the opinion in detail at that meeting. Um, and I, since that time, I incorporated the comments or changes into the draft. Uh, Justin also took a look at the draft and reviewed it and made some redline comments and stuff that were incorporated as well as Amber. So that's sort of the update from the last meeting. And I don't really have anything substantive to say because I think we discussed um, a lot of the substantive issues, but obviously um, I'll just open it up to any comments that anyone has about the revision. I just have some, like a series of um, kind of nitpicky things. <laughs> Should I just, yeah. Last, um, my, this, so that's a perfect reminder. Um, it, I feel like um, if you have, if you have comments that are about um, word choice or you're missing a comma, things like that, there's really not much value to doing that until we're at the, until we're quite final. I think it's super valuable to send that stuff to the lead drafter or to the committee. Um, but I don't, I don't think, I think this, for, this um, forum should be used for us to talk about substance. So um, as a general matter, I don't mean to be censoring anyone. I just wanted to make that observation. Um, is Justin? 
Did you have anything else you wanted to um, add about the revisions to the um, departing lawyer opinion? I think I've given all of my edits <laughs> okay. already. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Um, so the only um, substantial comment I had was I don't understand. There may be a very good reason for this, but I don't understand why we are not providing guidance on the issue of how you, what, how to navigate providing information to the new firm about conflicts. Um, I think that's a kind of that is, we do, we, we have so much guidance on other things and we just sort of say it's beyond the scope. And maybe, maybe that's an appropriate decision, but I just wanted to ask about that. Well, I think that that particular issue is very difficult in light of the confidentiality uh, rules that we have in California. And I think there was discussion, if I recall, about that issue. Um, for, you know, for example, uh, New York and some other states have specific provisions that allow for disclosure of information in these situations. California does not. I think it is a difficult thing for um, attorneys to navigate. And I think if we kind of chimed in on that, we would be potentially creating, you know, some kind of a standard where I don't think that, um, I don't know, get ourselves into trouble on some of the things. I mean, I think the decision to say that, you know, they just need to be mindful of those duties and do that in compliance is, is I think we had decided that was sort of the best that we could do here. Hmm. Um, it's really difficult to say, I mean, in different situations, whether even the identity of a client is, you know, a, a confidential thing, um, to what extent you can say things generally about, you know, your client base, revenue in, in groups, or kind of in an anonymous way when you're doing it. There's lots of things that people have suggested help to protect these concerns, but I, I'm not sure that we want to weigh in on that. And that's, I think, what we had decided before. But I'm, I mean, obviously, everyone should have, you know, press feedback on that point. Yeah, I mean, that that may be, it may be totally right that it's just not an area where we want to go. It just, I, I guess it just struck me, and, and I'm sorry if I'm forgetting that converse, that discussion, but when I was reading this, I felt like, you know, we're basically, like, this is the kind of thing, like, you'll have as your Bible for how to depart properly. And yet there's this one part to me, which is a huge like question. And yeah. it seems also, it seems similar to me in the sense that there's some mechanics to it. Um, at least that's my impression. There's some, there's some do's and don'ts, but um, that it might be helpful, but maybe it is too vexed. I don't know. Does anyone, anyone else have that reaction or have a thought on that? Yeah, I do. Um, <clears throat> I noticed that as well, but it seems to me that is a whole nother Mm -hmm. it, it is a huge topic, and the lack of those exceptions to confidentiality in California creates a problem. I mean, cobbling together some kind of implied confidentiality exception, and I know that that's been done in other contexts. But I think to really answer that question would probably entail writing an opinion, maybe not quite as long as this opinion, but it would be a substantial amount really address the issue. And although it's related, to me, it seems like it really needs to be on its own and not part of the issue. It, it, it only, it, I, mean, I think it would be, we should, it, it takes a whole discussion whether we even want to write. You know, this is one of those situations, and Medina's comments suggested it, that uh, where you don't actually know in advance whether an opinion would, would improve hurt. things yeah. or not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's, it's another case where being too explicit about how stupid California's confidentiality rules <laughs> would only be beneficial, <laughs> right. would yeah. only be beneficial if it were going to lead to a change, yeah. right? Otherwise, you're just handcuffing people yeah. uh, in, in working towards sensible solutions. Yep.
All right. Um, so I guess my thought was, um, can we just say that it could include f um, former clients? I mean, wouldn't or just any clients take out the word dormant? I think that would work fine there too. You know. Yes, I would think that would help a lot. But yeah, that's enough. Two o four. Yes. Sorry, yeah. No, that they're an asset. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good comment. I think we should just take out the word dormant because it's it's already sort of describing that they're, you know, clients of the departing lawyer whose matters are currently inactive. But yeah. I think so. But you're only proposing the deletion of dormant. No, but. I'm not sure I am. I think we should think about that. because, So what I take you to be wanting to do here, Dina, is to be um, addressing the issue that um, a, a law firm who wants to limit who the departing lawyer can contact could say, well, sure, you, you, you know, yeah, you have to contact those four, five clients who have ongoing matters, but that's it. You have no. You can't say you have an ethical obligation to contact those other clients. We're not doing anything from that for them right now. Is that sort of what we're trying to get at here? Yeah, I mean, I think it's getting at a subset of clients. That I mean, I think for some clients, it's not always exactly clear whether they're a current or former client. Meaning, you know, you do ongoing work for this client on a regular basis. Maybe at this particular point in time, there's not something that's active, but they're current. They're, they certainly would be considered a client of the firm, a current client of the firm, as opposed to a former client. So that's sort of what, you know, maybe so if I'm saying the matter's inactive, but I was trying to capture situations in which, you know, the client and related matters that they've worked on, whether it's like patent applications or a bunch of other things, that there's like ongoing work for this particular client. Maybe there's not something that right now that attorney is doing, but clearly that client would have an interest based on their relationship with that attorney and having knowing about the departure and having the ability to transfer their the matters that they worked on which related to ongoing matters that they do to the new firm and that's sort of the would it be would would it be would it capture that idea if we just said this would include um clients whom the lawyer reasonably believes may um all clients who you know sort of taking out the whole thing about the inactive I'm, I'm not sure that, I, I guess I'm just, what I'm struggling with is, you know, what are clients whose, whose matters are inactive? I mean, are they former, are they current clients? Well, and I, I share that concern, um, and that's why I ask if you were contemplating in the inclusion of currently inactive. I, that strikes me as a potentially nebulous term for which we're not offering any guidance, and I, from a simply a practical standpoint, it seems advisable that we suggest that uh, this determination as to who needs to be or contacted is dependent on whom the lawyer reasonably believes yeah. would want to transfer the work. It's a little more, I mean, it's still vague, but it, it strikes me as a bit more definitional by nature than currently inactive or dormant. And I understand, and I think there even may be within, um, certainly Act Tech and, and other estate planning organizations r uh, recognize the notion of a dormant client, but I don't know that outside of that context, it's something that's easily understood. Yeah, I mean, I think we can get rid of it. I mean, there was, before there was discussion of those and there was discussion of former clients and we kind of tried to streamline it. I think it's fine, you know, if everyone agrees to kind of make that change and, and just say that the, you know, take out the currently inactive part because then you're further defining what you probably don't want to further define, which is just that the matters that they reasonably believe would, you know, they wish to transfer. So I think that, that makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah. And, and I agree. I mean, there are, there are, sometimes you have clients that are, I have clients like this, they're engaged pursuant to a quote framework agreement, which basically says I'm going to be available, you know, for your legal ethics advice at your direction. So active to inactive, one phone call becomes an active client. So it makes sense to, I think, make that change. Yeah. So how, how would, so how would that sentence read? Uh, notification to, uh, to any client. Um, I, I think we could even take out of the departing lawyer. I mean, that's, well, 
what if we did? What if we said any clients? The departing lawyer reasonably believes. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think we definitely should take out of the departing lawyer because there's a lot of that that brings in that whole fight over whose client is it, right? Yeah. But does that? Can you just bring it down so we can read the whole paragraph? Yeah, there we go. Can maybe make like a single thing that damaged your one client? Yeah. Like a part of my other. And why likely would instead of this would include? Aren't we saying that, that this would include all those clients? Oh, sorry. Do I need to say it again? <laughs> well, I'm asking Dina, wouldn't it be this would include? I mean, that's what we're saying. Sure. More definitive. Well, can we? I, I, I think wiggle room, wiggle room is good. <laughs> um. But it's a duty, it's a duty. Anyway, but. Is it the difference? Is it the. I, I'm sorry. I'm yeah. Uh, is it the. Uh, is it the departing lawyer's reasonable belief that matters, or is it just that a reasonable lawyer would believe? I'm, not, I'm asking in a serious way. I mean, I'm not. I, you know, I'm just well, thinking. That, am I? I'm trying to. I'm trying to sort of get a grasp because what? It, so, the, so the firm says uh, we don't believe that. Right? We don't think that view is reasonable. Is it? Is it I'm just wondering. Well, in situations where there were, for, well, first of all, in situations where there would be a disagreement about that, then if the if the attorney really believed that that this was an, that notice was required under these circumstances, then they would have to do that, even if the firm refused to do that, right? But right, I, I didn't. This language was suggested by somebody in that context. I think just because, so that's not my language, but I, I mean, I think it makes sense here. I think because the sentence was kind of. We have some questions about the best way to say this. That's kind of how that language ended up being. I mean, I'm, it's, I, I don't think, I mean, yeah, you could say it could be more of an objective, reasonable belief, you know, yeah. that that would make sense. At right. some point, someone has to impose their beliefs on it. And yeah, the person I, I, that has the client a... relationship seems like they would be in a better position to assess yeah. that, you know. I, I think, I, I think it's probably okay. I just wondered a little yeah. bit. Yeah. I mean, we we say below that it's actually really the client, kind of the client's reasonable belief, right? I mean, you, you the, what the lawyer has to do is think about whether the client would likely expect to be told. Yeah, so that's what happens right. in the and next paragraph. Right, and this is paragraph. consistent with that, right? Right, um, I think so. Um, I guess we're trying to think about a couple different things. We're trying to think about making sure that the lawyer, the departing lawyer, notifies all the people that we want to, the, yeah. you know, doesn't ignore the clients he doesn't like, right? Um, and then we're also trying to think about giving the departing lawyer some, um, some protection when a firm is attempting to limit the lawyer, the, um, the clients. Yeah. And so does this do both of those things? Um, I, I think if this sentence and then the paragraph below accomplishes that. All right, are there other comments from anyone in the group? 
I just was wondering about the solicitation question. Microphone? Uh, b before we leave this topic, sorry, just a quick question for my own understanding in case it comes up. Is one of the reasons we're leaving likely because it uh, dovetails nicely with the paragraph below in which we say it is from the client's point of view that is is whose point of view should be determining whether or not notice is to be provided? Is that um, the reason for likely? And said another, or said another way, what is a situation in which the likely would play a role that notice would not be needed to be provided in that situation? So you're saying, is there, can, can we imagine a situation where the departing lawyer reasonably believes that a client uh, uh, might want to go with the lawyer, but doesn't, but the lawyer wouldn't have an obligation to tell the client? Is that right? I think so, but I'll just frame, frame it the other way. I'm comfortable with retaining likely. Yeah. If I'm just asking if I understand this correctly, the consensus of the group is that the general test is from the client's point of view, you know, whether the client would want to receive notice. If, if, it's, if that is the test, then the word likely works for me mm -hmm. because I could see it re being read in conjunction with that. If, it, if, it, if they're separate, then likely I'm a little uncertain or confused as to, yeah, it, how you phrase it. What When the likely situation would arise such that notice would not need to be provided when the lawyer reasonably believes that the client would wish to transfer their files with the departing lawyer. I don't mean to overcomplicate no, it. I just okay. want to know why, like, where yeah. the, a situation in which the likely is intended to res, ret, be retained. My sense is that's simply carryover language from the prior uh, version of the sentence when there was this concept of dormant clients mm -hmm. and those who are currently inactive. I don't, I can't foresee a scenario, but it's certainly worthy of discussion where it would not require or would not include so. I, I think I actually do agree with that. Um, I'm interested in Dina's reaction. Yeah. Well, and I'll just add this additional thought. I mean, my concern with retaining likely is it may offer some, and you called it wiggle room, I'll call it discretion to the attorney to say, well, the client may want to transfer the file, but I don't want the client. So I, I'm just concerned about that scenario. Yeah, yeah, no, I think that's right. That That is, so... It, so it seems like um, what, the first sentence says, okay, who's, who, who have you got to notify? You've got to notify uh, anyone that, where you're working on the matter, basically, in a rough way. And then we say, um, this, this includes anyone. So that's actually a little weird. I wonder if include is wrong, because um, I think maybe we're adding a sort of additional category or we're widening the circle with the second sentence. So first, it's anyone who, where you're responsible or play a principal role in delivering legal services. And then in addition, uh, there may be other clients who you reasonably know would want to transfer their files, even if you're not uh, playing a principal role. Is that right? So I'm not sure. It, or um, uh, what do you think of that? Do you think, or, or, or would, or is, is, is the second sentence a subset of the first or not? Well, I think it is. I mean, I, I just I don't want to have a situation where someone thinks like the argument, like this is not a quote unquote active matter or, um, I mean, because you could say plays a principal role, that's in the present tense. And when we talked about different situations in which it would be important to notify clients, um, I think this makes it clear that if the client has that expectation um, that they should also be notified. I mean, I don't know if you want to say helps to clarify what I think is not the intent of that sentence in the, the first sentence to, to only apply to sort of the present tense concept of representation, but I think it, it, I think it's helpful. 
um, we're, we're failing miserably to put our mics on. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think, um, what, what am I doing wrong? I have two mics. Does anyone else, does anyone else <laughs> no, have it's on, it's on. feedback on that? Does anyone else have feedback on that sentence? And well, my only feedback is that if it's a client, a client protective approach okay. would admit of no exceptions. If the lawyer reasonably concludes that the client would want to know, dormant or not, whatever, if the client would want to know, they must be notified, even if the lawyer doesn't want to continue to represent, the parting lawyer doesn't want to continue to represent them. That's cool. But the, the client, we've already determined that the client reasonably wants to know what the status of his or her law, lawyer is. And I, I don't see any reason why notice wouldn't be required to give the client the information whether the lawyer wants to represent them in the future or not. So I think just if, if once we start with the premise that the lawyer has concluded that notice should be given, why, how can there possibly be any exception to that? That's what I'm missing. I, I think I'm seeing it the way Amy is seeing it. I didn't notice it when I was reviewing it, but even though the word include implies it is a subset of the first category, it really isn't because the first set sentence is in present tense. So that simplifies. Okay, it, you notify clients on whose matters um, you are working as the principal attorney or the, the responsible attorney. That's, that's clear. Mm -hmm. When you start to get into, okay, what about these clients whom I haven't seen, whose matters I have not handled, who hasn't come to me? I mean, that could run, that list could potentially run long. <laughs> and, and, and then within that category, we then make kind of, you know, case by case evaluation. Um, seems like pretty nebulous, I think. Andrew. I'm sorry to add more time to discuss just the single word likely um, by raising the point, but I, I think removing likely is helpful. I do hear the concerns being raised. However, when you look at the clients uh, in this <clears throat> last sentence, this would include notification to any clients, which clients? The clients that you played a principal role for or were responsible for to me, it seems client protective as being um, stated and just helpful, I know it's not a duty, a professional courtesy for matters who are currently inactive, they're not former cl clients, they're inactive, and you know, maybe something related to that matter might come up in the next few months or the next year and you're telling them where you can now be contacted. There's also the wiggle room language that Amy might like is that it leaves the reasonably believes may wish to transfer their files. So I think dropping likely isn't as, doesn't raise all the concerns that might be being expressed around here, but that's just my limited opinion. Also, I think it's clearer, it's clearer direction for the lawyer, likely would. Well, maybe it likely wouldn't, therefore I'm not gonna tell them. Um, I, so Andrew, are you saying that it would say this includes notification? Take out the likelihood this includes notification too. I would just say this would include, or sure, you can say this includes. I agree with that. Um, so, okay, so I, I don't care at all about losing likely. I think that's fine. What I'm now concerned about is I think we're trying to introduce a new group. I think what we're saying is. The first group you have to tell is anyone whose matters you're principally working on. In addition, although I'm not saying those words should be added, in addition, if there are other clients who the lawyer reasonably believes may wish to transfer their files, you gotta tell them too, right? So I don't think it's right to say this includes because includes suggests it's a subset of the first uh, sentence. I would apply, it would apply to. Well, it's, it, it can't be, a, it's not defining what we've said above. It's adding something. Can it just be one sentence? Notice is required as to clients whose matters the departing lawyer is responsible for, comma, for whom she plays a principal role in the law firm's delivery of legal services, comma, or any other client that the departing lawyer reasonably believes. I think 
I think it works. Dina? That work for you, Dina? Great. And that would, then we'd have the parenthetical after that with the ABA opinion or? Yeah, yeah. That's nice also because it's not interrupting. Boom. <laughs> we'll figure out how to deal with the footnotes later. The footnote can be at the end of the sentence that Adam just articulated because it's just talking about notice and the notice obligation in general. Dina, I'm going to give you another comment, or the group, um, which is at line 249, um, you're talking about it's uh, directing um, the lawyer not to uh, talk to, um, tell, tell the clients that they're leaving. We say it's been widely rejected, and then we have one site. I sort of, like, if I, when I see something's been widely rejected, I expect to see more than one site. Well, there's the Pennsylvania opinion. There's, you know, I think there's two ABA opinions. Maybe there needs to be more. I mean, it's... Or is it an overstatement? Well, we can take out widely if you want to take out widely. Well, I'm, I, that's a, it's a, I'm, I just am asking if, if it's, if it's, if... Well, I don't know of any ethics opinion that says, that you know th this notion that um, you that that attorneys can't talk to clients until after they've left about their departure. I don't know a single ethics opinion or jurisdiction that thinks that's acceptable. Apparently, a long time ago, that used to be sort of a thing <laughs> mm -hmm. with this this you know concept of like clients belonging to firms and things like that, and you can't dare talk to anyone. And so, I I think that the current thinking is that it is widely rejected and I don't, you know, I'm not aware of any other jurisdiction that, especially given a lot of the communication, um, the model rules and our rules related to communication with clients that are more specific on these issues than they were before uh, that would hold that. Concept. I'm not questioning yeah. that it's right. I'm just yeah. saying when I read that and then saw, I just, yeah, because it's talking about the other informal opinions. I mean, I, I mean that ABA opinion is obviously kind of like the gold standard of what people are looking to because a lot of states don't have their own ethics opinions on departures, and so they look to that. Right. Um, I know the Pennsylvania opinion, which is more robust. I mean, there's Illinois has, I'm not sure it's a formal ethics opinion, but more like guidelines put out by their um, corollary ethics um, committees and they have a lot of guidelines related to that which say the same thing. I mean, so there's a lot of jurisdictions that have those that, that who have published on this say that. I don't know, again, of a single authority that says that, but. Yeah, that, that satisfy me probably. Yeah. Yeah, that's probably good enough. We're around line 250. Two, yeah, yeah, exactly. It's exactly there. Um, all right, then I had a question um, at line 484, that area, con conflict of interest, where you say that um, the lawyer needs to make a, a um, comprehensive inquiry to bring to light any conflicts of interest. And you sort of talk about it as it's going two directions. Uh, it's any, um, whether any of the departing clients will have a conflict um, with the new firm and whether the departing lawyer may have conflict with any clients of the new firm. I, I just couldn't understand. I, I feel like those are the same thing. Like if I have a client and the law firm is adverse to that client, we both, you know, there's 
there's conflicts on both sides. I guess I just couldn't follow if, if those are two categories or if it's really the same category. Yeah, I mean, I think the distinction is being made between the departing lawyer's clients and, and potential conflicts with a new firm. And then, of course, if um, whether or not there's um, the departing lawyer has any conflicts with the clients of the new firm, which is more complicated by virtue. I mean, I, I understand what you're saying. Like, you could potentially say that these are the sort of the same things, but like, typically you have. Sometimes, I guess what I'm saying is like the departing lawyer has certain clients that they're going to, that they may anticipate that they're going to be bringing with them who they feel like they would want to use that attorney no matter what. They anticipate that they're going to come with them to a new firm. And those are things that need to be vetted. But it's also, you know, it's obviously broader than that with respect to sometimes former clients or maybe they've been exposed to okay. uh, confidential information by way of uh, prospective client or they were involved in some matters that may not come with them, but that that kind of needs to be, you know, vetted too, but, um, and maybe that's not being captured the right way. So. I don't know. I mean, I get that. That makes sense to me what you just said. Um, and if nobody else, uh, snagged on that, then I think it's probably not worth worrying about. Um, I think I'm getting close to the end at the, at the conclusion. Um, um, two suggestions. One, I'll take them in reverse order. One is at line 571. We say that one of the, the ethical duties is to avoid conflicts of interest with clients. And I wonder if we might say taking reasonable steps to avoid Avoiding, um, could we just say avoiding or resolving? I guess I also had a general question that just occurred to me, which is we say in the conclusion that the client's right to counsel of choice and the protection of the client's best interests are the principles that govern a departure, which seems right, although it's also true that it may be very inconvenient for a lawyer, I mean for a client, if the lawyer's departing. And that's, you know, it may not be in the client's best interest. The client must may very much well prefer that the lawyer not depart. It may be inconvenient. It may be there, you know. But that—that's not what we mean, right? I mean, we mean with, you know, we don't mean that the lawyer can't ethically depart mo in most circumstances, even if it's not the not what the client would most prefer. Yeah, it's protecting their interests in light of the departure. Obviously, the clients yeah aren't in a position to dictate whether an attorney can right can leave, and that's not what yeah. And that's kind of from the you know the nineteen eighty five. Opinion, the it's just like that general. Those are the general principles that were articulated in that opinion, um, and in the ADA opinion, those are like key concepts. You know, so it's sort of trying to do things that are within the in the client's best interest, which I think the opinion discusses, as opposed to looking at it from the attorney's perspective or the firm's perspective and what most convenient or in their best interest. So, yes, at, at heart, that may not be in you know, it it, it is inconvenient for clients sometimes for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's an odd, odd thought, maybe, but maybe you could s capture the thought that, soften that, sorry, here's the mic, the mic is on, 
Um, what if you said just that are the ethical principles that should guide any attorney departure? So it doesn't have quite the same suggestion uh, uh, and, and just drop the guiding up front so they would just that way it comes a little. That sounds, yeah, that sounds great. Shall we wind it up? Yes. And they would just take out that govern and then, you, then you're good. Adam, I think that's a great question that you just asked me, and I'm not sure. So let me let's let me try to just play out what this means, and and maybe what what I was reacting to. So one of the so one of the things that departing lawyer has an obligation to do, according to us, is to avoid conflicts of interest with clients. So what does that mean? The lawyer's leaving. Um, they. They do, to, they do a conflicts check to find out if there are conflicts, fine. Uh, if there are conflicts, they what? Don't go to the new firm. They... Wait, right. That's, so that's resolving. Yeah, and also screening could be resolving, too. Right. So that's why. I get, think that's what I was... Um, or maybe just say address conflicts of interest. Yeah, I was going to say avoiding is maybe not the right word. I mean, you right. try to, like... You know, you want to mitigate or resolve, or in some cases, then you're, but you, you, yeah. I, I like avoiding more than resolving, actually. I like address. Avoiding address? more addressing. Address. Can we Resolving's, say addressing? I, I don't know. Yeah. All right, but I don't like avoiding because it suggests, I mean, it suggests that basically, like, you're, you know, if you identify a conflict of interest, that's the end of that. Avoiding or otherwise addressing? Or, I mean, I, I don't well, what is avoiding? I, 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 I'm fine taking that out. Yeah. Right. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I, that last sentence, I, the, is it member or licensee? OK. Because some opinions had that, and I didn't know if that was the right language, and I became confused. Well, yeah. if you have a question, you can change. So now all the member references have been changed. To licensee. Okay, that's what I thought, but thank you for clarifying. Yeah. <laughs> so, actually, this should also take board of trustees. Yeah, I'm not sure that that. So we'll, we'll fix it when yeah. it goes out. Okay. We'll come and don't worry about it. That's well, appropriate there for the opinion of the employer. Right. Yeah, that's my. Yeah. I guess I also had a question about the um, capitalization convention we're using. Um, is it helping us a lot to have the lawyer and departing lawyer um, as capitalized in, in the context of this opinion? Um, let's see. Do we have, okay, so we do that, we define it. Not initial capital. Right, that's true, but it is in the statement of facts. But I guess it, I felt like it led to a lot of like, sometimes it's capitalized. And I, I think you were consistent, I think you were, you had uh, an organization, organizing principle, but I'm wondering. Yeah, I mean, I used departing lawyer, capitalized, and lawyer when I was talking about this specific fact pattern, and when I was sort of being more general. And I understand this is a general fact pattern, which leads to right. Um, and then, but generally, making sort of general comments about lawyers, and then I would uh, not capitalize that term, but or law firms. But however you want. Yeah, usually if we initial cap it's even with a generic term like departing lawyer or attorney it's used as the pronoun and we wouldn't put the the in front of it um oh interesting as a peer so ah. i'm not saying that's right or wrong but we should think about how we're using the term departing lawyer here is it a particular person and then we're using lawyer lowercase when we're talking about lawyers duties generally um well the reason i i had the def the the capitalization applied to departing lawyer and lawyer because otherwise every single sentence can be departing lawyer, departing lawyer. So I was trying to also be able to have a sentence where we use the word lawyer and talking about the first, you know, in the same way. But because I felt like it was very clunky to read that if departing was asserted in front of everything. But I mean, I'm open to how people want to, like, from a convention's perspective, if we want to take out the does or. 
of more capitalization or less. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I guess for me, I think you're right, Dean, is that you're, it's the, because it's a, gener a very generic fact pattern, like just randomly taking a sentence, you know, lines 147 to 148, when you say the departing lawyer and law firm must be cognizant of ethical obligations throughout the transition period. I mean, obviously, that's, that could be either a statement relating to your fact pattern, or it could just be a general piece of ethical guidance. Um, so... And here, I'm not sure, because, because there aren't any facts in your fact pattern, really, other than she's leaving, there isn't any opportunity to say, OK, here, she did x, and that was good or bad. Yeah. So I do sort of wonder if we could just, if uh, I don't know. I mean, I think you'd have to play around with it to see if it read better if you took out the thes, or if it read better if you just got rid of the um, the defined terms. Get rid of the defined terms, how so? What, what do you mean by that? Well, I mean, I guess, or maybe use them much less. Like in the sentence I just read for you, uh, I think you could just say, a departing lawyer and law firm must be cognizant. I mean, this kind of, it seems like this is, a, is equally a generic statement as a statement on your fact pattern. Yeah, I mean, I was kind of taking it from the point of view of this is a generic thing and then walking through the steps of what this departing lawyer and the law right. firm are going to do as we move through these different ethical issues. And so that's why yep. I felt that it applied to the, the fact pattern. But Yeah. It's certainly not something that... Like in makes... line 177, the departure of a lawyer is a significant development. I mean, that's a more generic statement with respect to current clients of the law firm for whom the departing lawyer is providing legal services. I mean, right. And I tried to use lawyer more than attorney because I know that's what the new rules do, but sometimes you <laughs> get sick of it. You get sick, exactly. <laughs> but I don't know if people have an opinion about that, too, because I know some of our opinions, it's attorney everywhere. And some of them, and I tried to use lawyer, but there were times when I was like, I can't use the word lawyer for the third time in the sentence. So I don't know. <laughs> it's a challenge. I would have any problem with that. Okay. Uh, I get the question. In whatever decision we make, I think the opinion needs to be read top to bottom to take in this approach and the consideration. My sense is I don't know that just taking out the the in front of every initial capped departing lawyer is going to address or solve the question that Amy raised. I don't know that that's the case, but that's just my sense. It's a long opinion, and these phrases appear quite frequently. So that's what you want to have happen, which is the the being taken out in front of all the, the words. That's how it's... I personally don't feel strongly about it, but I think we should come to a consensus, because I think Amy's right. There is some disagreement within the opinion as to when they're used. Um, and whatever decision the group makes, I think the opinion needs to be read carefully top to bottom to make sure it's uniform throughout with that decision in mind. Is that, is that something that could be done after we've voted on it? I don't think so. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yeah, that's just language, right? Um, all right. Could, um, could I ask, if we do that, I, I would ask, you know, as part of the vote, I would, not because I don't want to take it on, I would prefer to defer to, to Dean as the lead drafter, take the first look at that um, as to where those edits w would be made. And then, you know, as you all know, staff does a top to bottom um, editing, site check, all that stuff. Um, but with respect to this particular assignment, as long as Dean is okay with it, I would prefer that she take the first stab at that assignment because she's so intimately familiar with how it, with how it is reading. So that could be part of any motion that yeah. might be made here. Um, so can I present to the group or generally are people feeling <clears throat> like this is an opinion that we could vote out? Well, I'd, I'd like to address something. Great. Uh, this
When it's red, it's on? Yes. Oh. I was like, why do you keep uh, turning it off when I'm talking? Of course. <laughs> oh, that's obvious. <laughs> when, I, when I wanted silence, I put it on red so I know. <laughs> uh, something's wrong. Yeah, red means go, right? Um, so, well, I wanted to start with, um, there's a section on solicitation that I, yeah, it starts at 367 in the red line, which was of great interest to me. I, I think that's the issue that everybody thinks about the most. Can you, can you, what is solicitation? Can it occur <clears throat> when the lawyer's at the firm, and then what can the lawyer do after the lawyer leaves the law firm? And I think that's, that's something that fundamentally comes up all the time. Most of the stuff is fairly mechanical otherwise. So I was interested. I need to hear more about it. I'm, I'm not fresh on the rules. But I see it lines 322 to 23. We constructed a joint or unilateral notice. It said the departing lawyer's ability and willingness to continue to represent the client. That's, I, was, I thought, and then later on, you appoint, you question whether you can solicit. I was wondering, isn't that an act of solicitation to say, I'm, I'm willing and I'd like to continue to be your lawyer when I go to my new law firm or wherever I'm going? Um, and this doesn't flag what you, what you then flag later as the, as the fiduciary due problem. It's a fiduciary duty problem. It, seem, it seems to me that telling a client while you're still a partner in a law firm that I'm leaving and I want to continue to be your lawyer at my new law firm, why wouldn't, is, 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 is there a law that addresses that point? Isn't that breach of fiduciary duty? You are competing with your partners while you're still a partner. Well, oh, sorry, I'll let you finish your comment. I'm, I'm, I'm done with that comment. Okay, so we are not opining on the fiduciary duty issues and I think that's pretty clearly stated in here. That language, um, it's not only from like the ABA opinion, but when you're you, the lawyer, the client needs to know your ability. Like, can you actually represent the client going forward? You're giving them notice. You're leaving the law firm. I am actually leaving like this, you know, big law firm, and I'm going to go out on my own as a solo, and I am not able to take on that class action matter that I'm working. So I'm not able to do that. Or the, the willingness being a, a, is a factor too. Like this is not necessarily a client that I can continue to work with for rate reasons or other reasons at my new firm. So those are important things that need to be identified. The tension that you're talking about is absolutely an issue in the sense that it's it's you're, these are all things that need to be disclosed to the client. We discussed throughout the opinion in this section um, related to, you know, you need to help them make an informed decision, which includes giving them information related to what your rates are going to be look like at your new firm, like what your staffing is going to be look like, which attorneys are going to go with you. Those are things that help the client to make an informed decision. So, but that, you're right. I mean, the idea of saying that versus saying, what can I do to get you to come with me, you know, that becomes my rates are low my rates are lower i'm fully available uh we have great lawyers at my new firm but i'm not soliciting well not we're not so saying that you can't solicit them either by the way because you can solicit them now why, whether or not what why, why is is that i mean you're the expert i'm not challenging i'm just no, i'm, I'm just curious as to why I'm, I'm why why we aren't this is important because, to me at least i mean Matt, under rule 7.3 it's not solicitation to offer your services to a existing client. Then, then if we think that's clear, then we should wow. say that that's not a breach of fiduciary duty. No. That's fiduciary duty is a different issue. Uh, I, I don't. You're but, talking about but two types is, of solicitation, yeah, I think, okay. Matt. There's the ethical concept, and then there's the concept of I'm soliciting you in breach of a fiduciary obligation. So you don't think, so we're do. comfortable. I, I just thought as a reader of this, I would say, I, I get it. I can tell them about my willingness. I'm very willing, sure. and I'm able. Right. I'm going somewhere where we're all willing and able to continue this great relationship. That 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 doesn't. We're absolutely confident that while you're still a partner in a law firm, that doesn't breach any fiduciary duty. No, that's not what the opinion says. Yeah, it is true. absolutely not what the opinion says. It says about more than once. And I, I think your point is it's really good that you're raising this because it, we may, may need to say it even louder and clearer. Uh, I, I think that's what I'm. Yeah. I think that's what I'm suggesting. But I I think it. I actually think 
they probably would breach your fiduciary duty. But I mean, there's this I, tension. Why don't you look at line 402 or 401 to the rest of that paragraph where it says, this is a decided intersection between the ethical rules requiring notice and permitting solicitation, the scope of the fiduciary duties among partners and potential contractual obligations between partners. Thus, the question of whether such conduct would violate fiduciary duties between partners or amount to unfair competition is an open question that is likely to be very fact specific. We are not, I mean, we could add a sentence saying we are not opining on that, but I think we've said that in many other contexts throughout the right. opinion, you know. I just want to know, Matt, are you think, saying we're, it's just not um, in your face enough, or is it another issue? So if I'm leaving and I read this opinion, I would see that I can tell clients, it, it flat out says that, it doesn't really, it doesn't particularly cite any authority, that's the bullet list. Well, it yeah. doesn't cite any authority that says it's not a breach of fiduciary duty. It cites authority that says you're ethically right. obligated well, to provide certain information. I, I would... I would feel, once I read that, I'd say, well, that's good. I can express my willingness and ability, um, which I don't, I don't know how we can cleave that and say, well, that's, that's, that's not solicitation. I, I, I think val a valid argument can be made that that certainly is, because it's certainly inviting the client. But then, then we go on to say that it's an open question, and we are not addressing the intersection with law of competition and fiduciary duty, which the reader goes, well, can I do it or not then? Well, I agree with you that I, I, I think I raised this actually at the last meeting, and we talked about the fact that after I got done reading the section on what do you have to tell the client, and then I got to the solicitation, I thought, well, wh we've already been through that. So I do think that they're really close, just like Dina was saying they are. Like, well, So it, what, what would you tell clients, Dina? If they say, so can I tell them? Will I run the risk of breaching fiduciary duty if I were to say, 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 the, say I'm, I'm ready, willing, and able, which basically says I want to be your lawyer? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to go into what advice I would give the clients who are consulting me about that, but this language is language that's consistent with Rule 1.4, which is listed below. It's, right, yeah. it's consistent with what the ABA has said on this. It's consistent with other ethics opinions in this bullet list. You have to let a client know Otherwise, it's like I'm leaving the firm and going there. Okay, do you? Should I come with you? Can I come with you? Like, is there enough attorneys that can work on my matter? Like, what are your rates going to be? The, the client can't possibly make an informed decision without knowing these basic things. Starting with, are you like, are you confident? The the the, the ability to do it is a competent question, right? Are are you? Well, well, you're saying that ethically, you can answer all those questions. You, and you right. have to. You I, have and to I'm, give them and that I'm not. And, I, but and it's a, and it becomes a matter of the firm. Like they're also clients. You know, if they have such a close relationship with that attorney, and the attorney's going somewhere that has a platform where they can continue to work with them, the client's going to go uh, probably right, with right. that attorney. And if and if and if not, and they're just sort of um, they're going somewhere that doesn't fit what the client wants for representation. And that there's other people at the firm that the client's been at that can are perfectly capable of doing the work, and they want to say, then they'll then we're they'll talking. stay. We, uh, I'm I'm not arguing with any of that. Yeah, it seems to me everyone resoundingly believes that those things can be discussed without violating the rules of professional conduct. In fact, they're probably required. Yes. Okay. But then someone says, but you can't say those things because it's breach of fiduciary duty. We're just leaving the reader uninformed as to. That and, and, and do you well, think that's I just think, not the role of our committee, other than to say it's possibly a breach of fiduciary? How could it be a breach of fiduciary duty to do something that is required by the rules? Well, we say that somewhere in the opinion. I can find it where there's that where the partners are trying to say something like, you know, whether it's a contractual provision saying you can't talk to clients after you give notice until you leave or something like that. That if that violates an ethical obligation, then you know the the attorney has an obligation to follow their ethical. We should reasons. say that. It's in the. It's in here. And then we probably should say it there. Uh, and that, but that that gets to I the mean, to to the other section. We can say another sentence in that section, like in the four hundreds, if you think it's helpful, where we talk about that intersection between those issues, um, and say that we're not opining on that again. I, I I think that we 
we certainly can't opine on what is a breach of fiduciary duty in, in this context, right? I, I mean, would wonder what would be a breach of fiduciary duty. If you tell them I'm leaving and you, and you conform to what this opinion says, you conform to the rules, and, and, and you do things which you tell me are firmly required by the rules of professional conduct, how could anyone say that breaches fiduciary duty? I mean, I don't, I don't well, know. Well, I don't I think would. if they followed that, these guidelines that they would be. I mean, if they were planning for, you know, six months to leave and they were talking to their clients and trying to get all, you know, all without the firm knowing and doing things that were undermining the firm's, their, their partnership relationships with partners at the firm and trying to funnel clients to come with them in a way that was very deceptive, that would be potentially, again, I'm not, you know, that could potentially rise the level of a breach of fiduciary duty. Because you're duty. violating other rules. But I, you're, yeah, but the, but just simply notifying the clients of your departure in a way that you're obligated to do under these rules is not, I don't view that as a breach of fiduciary duty, but I also don't want us to be saying, like, I'm, we're not going to make that final we're not, proclamation, we're, we're right? We're not making so, that final call, but I, the way I've when, always read this opinion is that this opinion gives a lot of comfort, right, uh, to a lawyer who's worried about being charged with a breach of fiduciary duty for the 1.4 stuff, right? It gives you a ton of comfort for 1.4, and that seems right, right? Because how can it be that the client should not be given what they need to be given, right? I guess And, my... and it, it's, it's framed in a way, Matt, it's framed as I understand the 1.4, the way we've set 1.4, we kind of say, look, this all starts when we tell the law firm. So you tell the law firm, ordinarily, that's when you should be, that's when it should happen. So it's going to be a kind of a regulated process uh, that uh, where, and anyway, that that's what we're doing. I can make my question But better. what we're not doing, and what we do very carefully here, is we're saying that once you go beyond that, right, and you get into the sort of back and forth and so forth and so on, that it may be then you've got an ethical permission under 7.3, but not an ethical obligation. And we don't rule on the question of how the permission uh, relates to whatever your contractual or fiduciary obligations might be. That's I, sort I, of the way I think I what I'm at, what I'm, what I could be advocating for is if you, if your conduct complies with the rules, and it, it, it's not misleading, et cetera, et cetera. It complies with all the ethical rules in the manner that you tell a client about your willingness and ability to serve them while you're still there, which, again, I wonder about that. But, but afterwards, after, after you leave, those two scenarios where you, you, you can contact a client, say, I, I want to be your lawyer again. And if you don't, if you aren't violating, if you aren't doing that in a misleading way, that violates any of the rules, I, I don't see how we, how that, any of that could be breach of fiduciary duty. And if, and why aren't we comfortable just saying that? I think that's important to people because we're talking about ethical rules and imperatives. And we, and we tell people, well, we think you can ethically do this, but we are not going to touch what we view as kryptonite, which is basically this uh, fiduciary duty problem. I would find it unsatisfying. I what think what this is the said? What you can do? I thought this opinion was you must do this. I, I yeah, I said that there are times when there are things I learned from this opinion that you must say so. And then and then I th I read it as for this other stuff that maybe you can do. There might be some other issues. You might well, uh, for, 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 just because something is within the ethical guidelines doesn't mean that you aren't going to get. You don't have other legal obligations for it. What would those legal obligations be? Maybe, maybe, maybe that's the way to get to it. Is how if you comply with all the rules in, in the way you talk to a client while you're still with the firm or after you leave the firm, yet the law firm says, I, "I'm now going to sue you for breach of fiduciary duty." Did some someone give me the fact pattern? Matt, but it, it's this not is, a well, this. Well, your proposal either puts us in a position of saying something that is really dramatic that we can't sustain, or it blows the opinion up uh, into a huge discussion uh, of uh, the law of breach of fiduciary duty, that's A, not probably what we should be opining about anyway, and B, 
um, going to be hugely controversial and will delay this extremely useful opinion for another year. Is that what you want to do? I mean, you can't Wait. just say it. No, right. I don't want to blow things up. I don't want to delay for that, a year. That, I didn't say any of that, well, so, Stephen. Well, so, offer, so what's, I, 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 what's I your constructive well, solution? I, have a, I have, maybe have a solution. Well, I think my constructive, I, I think it's my own lack of famili current familiar, because I've, you know, having left law firms, and I've, and I've written about this, but it's been a while, and, and you do it all the time. But it, I mean, I just, and, and so I guess we should move on. Uh, but I do want to say that I find it dissatisfying that we give all this opinion and advice and then we say, however, we don't, there's this whole area of law that may override, that's, that, that's implicitly what this says. There's a whole area of law that, law of competition, unfair competition, fiduciary duty, that implicitly may, may change what, what we've told you you can and must do. Joe, did you want to say something? Um, well, yeah, I'll say it really quickly, although I think we kind of morphed. I, I'm back on your initial point with the bullets, and I think we moved to this business of do we say whether, you know, the ethics trumps fiduciary duty. But just quickly on the, on the first point, the starting point, um, I'm just wondering, Dina, on, on that sentence where, he, where, where Matt raised the issue, how critical is the willingness? I mean, to me, ability kind of implies willingness. And so I was just wondering if we don't have to have that, is taking that out, make it a little less of what Matt caught Matt, where he thought, wow, you're telling someone you can go out there and really advocate to come with you as opposed to someone else, and wouldn't that be solicitation in the sense of some kind of breach of fiduciary duty? I don't know if that helps, but I mean, willingness doesn't, I mean, that's kind of implied to me. If you're telling the client, I'm moving to this firm, I'm going to keep doing the following types of things, I'm still going to do, you know, products liability work or whatever, and that's what you've been doing for the client. I mean, it's kind of implying that, you know, you're available. Well, um, you, may be a, you may have the ability to be unwilling to. And so you need to let the client know whether you, you know, you would like to continue to represent them. I mean, I guess, okay. And if so, that, I'll, I'll accept that. To me, that's kind of split, like, my ability is going to be color. I mean, if, if I'm unwilling to do it, it's kind of like I'm unable to. I mean, that's getting super technical. Could I theoretically do it? Yes, I have the ability, but I don't want to. Or so. I mean, it just seems to me that ability implies that, you know, I'll do it. You can come with me, and I can handle the case. I can be competent. Yeah, uh, I mean, ability is more of like trying to trigger the confidence issue, yeah, than the sort of uh, availability and willingness. I have a question, and maybe right. I don't know if anyone has an, an answer to this. But is there are there cases, appellate cases, or even trial cases, where this scenario has resulted in a in, intentional interference with the contract or breach of fiduciary claim that's been sustained by the court, where a lawyer has solicited a client's laugh, and that has actually resulted in in some finding of breach of fiduciary duty or damages? I mean, I don't have knowledge of any such case law off the top of my head. I just wonder, do, is it out there? It if anyone knows. <laughs> huh? <laughs> that have really, like, egregious fact patterns which are difficult to apply to normal situations. A, a More egregious these, than that. Than there's, this. there's not a lot of California what case law, right? right? About this, I'm not, yeah. but, no, but, but what would be, the, you know, the question like, is... you know, in the middle of the night going in and stealing all the files from the computer and okay. sending out messages to everyone implying that somebody's other partner died. I mean, there's there's a lot of there's certain fact patterns in a couple cases out there that I think everyone looking at would be like, well, yes, you should be able to make claims against that particular person. But so we we most don't of know. These are issues that tend to be resolved in arbitration, right? In a confidential setting because of partnership agreements, and so there's not a lot of case law out there on those issues. And the the reality is, I think that because when a client actually chooses to do something like go with one attorney or stay at a firm. Right. Because it's their choice, it's difficult to show damages related to that particular issue if you think there, there's um, a problem here because the client's going to say, I wanted to go with A or stay with B, right? So it's difficult from that, just that perspective. Again, that's not, you're sort of asking about some of like the legal yeah. framework of it, but I, um, yeah, so the answer to being whether there's a lot of case law addressing this, that in California, the answer is 
No. None that would be helpful. Mostly out of state, old, and bad. <laughs> okay. There's the Howard case. Well, that's well, but, but there is the Howard case, which is a cautionary one about opining too strongly about when the ethics rules beat the contract, right? Uh, Maybe the, this this limitation, I guess I'm thinking of 1.7, this material limitation in our opinion, maybe that should be flagged in a footnote or, or a little more prominently than in, in the text of the opinion uh, with respect to the fact that we're not opining on, on whether there might be scenarios that where this would breach uh, an attorney's fiduciary duty to a partner. Just a suggestion, because I think I feel like that's in there a couple times, but I certainly can take another look. Oh, I'm just, it. it's yeah. in footnotes. It's, it's in, I, it is in a footnote. Yeah, it's yeah, probably in the text. Too. Okay. But just, but would you also feel more comfortable if it was put up in the front? Yeah. I just wonder if it needs to be more prominent. Yeah. I don't. I. It's. It's the disclaimer, if you want to call it that, is 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 important if we want to make it clear that we really are saying we aren't we aren't giving you any advice on, on non fiduciary duty responsibility we and I but I but I've gone beyond that I just I if the California Supreme Court approves these rules and it has and there's no statute that says that conduct violates statutory law you really have to wonder if you comply with rules that the Supreme Court has has approved how how a law firm can cause you to, to conduct yourself in a way that violates that that is inconsistent with with uh, the rules or the law firm would, would attempt to enforce contractual provisions like that and they yeah <laughs> they probably would not in the, in the fact pattern i mean if somebody complied in this way it would seem unlikely that a law firm would have so any I, real I, real basis to pursue a claim yeah. for breach of fiduciary duty based on complying with these ethical rules and giving notice in this way you know but <clears throat> So, so the first place we, we um, make reference uh, to uh, the limitations is at the end of the first section of the discussion. And we say the opinion will seek to resolve, uh, <clears throat> not seek to resolve all issues of substantive law, identify. <clears throat> um, sorry, I thought I thought I'd found it. Is that the first place we talk about it? Um, Issues that are often implicated. I'm just trying to figure out where is the first place we say it. Oh, it's right. In analyzing the rights and obligations, there's a tension between the compliance with the rules and fiduciary duties. Um, <clears throat> and maybe we, you say right there, you know, that that's, you know, we're, that's beyond the scope, or we're not. I know you don't like that, Matt, but I don't no, think I, anyone I, else in the room would be comfortable with us taking a position on what's a breach of fiduciary uh, again, duty. I'm, I, I'm talking about something different. Again, which is, uh, I'm comfortable with the disclaimer that I'm. I'm not. But I just wonder whether we shouldn't be saying, saying something far more firm. Okay, listen. And line 131. During the transition process, the party lawyer and the law firm may also have legal obligations to one another which could include fiduciary duties and contractual obligations. To the extent possible, when there is a conflict between the departing lawyers and the law firm's ethical obligations to the client and the lawyer and law firm's obligations to each other, the former should prevail. I'm sorry, that's line. 131 to 135. For example, the law firm should not attempt to enforce contractual obligations on a departing attorney, departing lawyer, the red one. that would prevent, oh yeah, sorry, I'm looking at the same version. Um, it's, it's right before section three, the paragraph before section three. In the red line? Um, the law firm should not attempt to enforce contractual obligations on the departing lawyer that would prevent the departing lawyer from complying with ethical obligations to our clients or interfere with the client's right to choice of counsel. Then why are we. <laughs> right. So. There's no authority cited there, by, by the way. Right. Isn't that the point? I mean, you you can't, a law firm cannot have a contractual provision that if we decide lawyers 
can and must say certain things to clients. There's no, why tell people fiduciary duty can still be a problem when when ethical obligations are going to trump the trump fiduciary duties among law partners. Fiduciary duties encompass a whole wide range of things we're just talking about in this context, right? I mean, so there could be situations of a departure where a person does breach fiduciary duties of a firm. You know, I, if you're giving notice, you've talked to the firm, told them you're leaving, and you're communicating this information to a client, you know. I mean, I think we've come out pretty strongly and 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 with citing authority. For example, when when we say um, in line 244 of the red line that any directive not to talk to um, partners must be viewed with skeptically, um, and that it's been and that that's been widely rejected. Although I guess I kibosh the widely, but um, and then we cite authority. I mean, I, I do. I don't. I mean, I think this is a. This is a this is a nuanced opinion, and you do have to actually read it, as opposed to like just getting a bullet point from it. But I think there's a lot in here that would help a lawyer combat a claim by the law firm that there was a breach of fiduciary duty. But I don't. I'm not sure that we can. I, I don't see how we would go any further. Well, and Andrew, I mean, it, wouldn't that be outside of what we're supposed to do? I mean, to come to the conclusion that you couldn't be in breach of some other obligation by virtue of analyzing the ethical issue. I mean, it strikes me it's kind of like that opinion we did where, um, you know, the, the judge was saying, tell me the confidential information you want to get out of the case. Tell me what it is. Well, I can't tell you, Your Honor, because I don't have the permission of my client and I have this duty of confidentiality. And well, I'm, you're going to be in contempt. We wouldn't write an opinion that says, well, you can't possibly be in civil contempt because you've complied with your ethical obligation with respect to confidentiality. I mean, I, it's just a tension. I, I, don't, I don't think we can go there, and I, I don't think we should. I mean, despite the absence of a lot of good law, it's complicated, and the claims come up. And I think it'd actually be a disservice to tell a lawyer that you can absolutely rely on this opinion to be a bulletproof defense to any kind of, you know, breach of fiduciary duty claim. I think it goes too far and we can't do it anyway. And yet at line 162, he said the law firm should not attempt to enforce something. And your point I'm, is I'm, I'm just saying that we're, that, that we're pretending like we don't say these things and yet I think we do. And I, would you take that language out? No. Yeah, I thought you okay. No. So what's no. the problem? We can't go further. You like what's in it. What's the? What are we? What are we talking about? Is there something more? No. I. You know. I. I. I think I. I think I've said what I wanted to say. I. I think I've listened to what everyone has to say as well. Okay. Okay. Um. So I think. Um, all right, so is there anyone else who has sort of wants to talk about any sort of big picture issues? A, a question arose for me, Drew, um, in the bullet points that begin on the red line, line 322. <clears throat> uh, he referenced the willingness and unwillingness issue. And I didn't notice that before, but as I read the opinion now, it's, it strikes me as, the, and as strange in the way the bullet points are structured. I think I'm comfortable with how they're structured. I like how it's written. However, when you read this bullet point, the departing lawyers and the law firm's ability and willingness or inability and unwillingness to continue to represent the client. Next one, the client's option. I always thought it was a client's right because the client can choose to stay with the law firm, go with the departing lawyer or to the new firm or choose another lawyer or law firm entirely. Are you able to choose when someone's telling you they're unwilling to to take you, um, does the is the client still retained with a quote unquote choice in that example? That's issue number one. Number two, is it can lawyers and law firms say I'm unwilling to take you? Well, I mean, I, I guess could see unable. I don't have the resources. Whatever yeah. the situation might yeah. be, I'm retiring. Whatever it might be, yeah. but the willingness issue, I, I just hadn't heard that language before, and I'm happy. I'm happy to learn about it. I, I didn't know where that comes from. Well, I mean, I believe that language is in some of the other ethics things, which I can pull up. I mean, because that's where 
part of these checklists have come from. So it's like, you know, forms that are kind of, um, and so I can, I can look at that. Um, but I do think you raise a point, which is just that it says the notice whether joining unilateral should inform the client. I mean, maybe we should say where applicable or something like that, because I think there's different situations. You're going to send different notices to clients in certain situations where it's like, if you want to give them the choice to come with you, you're not going to tell a client you have the choice for me or, or stay at the firm or you know hire Justin or whatever if those aren't options for them. So it obviously needs to be tailored to situations, but choice is an important part, right? So they have these choices. And so just like, you know, I think in some situations, um, you know, the if you're unwilling, if you're unable to continue the representation, mm -hmm. that needs to be part of your notice to that particular client, right? And you wouldn't then give them the choice to come with you for that answer that question so um it's like unilateral it's like the termination rule and i mean yeah i don't mean to open up a can of worms i know it's different in the departing lawyer context but it just struck me as strange like i'm unwilling to take you any longer well you wouldn't say it like that I right mean, right so you're not like sorry i'm just my sarcasm's of course, any, but and i think there's a discussion obviously if you were going to terminate the representation you have to do it in the right way you know, but there may be situations where um, uh, you're not able, and so, uh, and uh, yeah. And well, I tell you, I think practically speaking, this from my own practice, I've seen situations where a lawyer is perfectly capable, has the knowledge and experience to pr continue with a matter, and doesn't want to. Says, you know what, you're you're well situated here. At current law firm, um, it's not working out. Uh, I'm not willing to to take you on. Putting putting it in a more maybe uh, could be a problem nice client uh, too. Uh, uh, sorry, could be a problem client. Could yeah. be. I think you know it, it, uh, we use the term un unworthy client sometimes in in, in matters yeah. I've seen, and and sometimes you are unwilling to take those types of clients with you, uh, assuming you can do not do so consistent with your ethical obligations. So I think there is a very important distinction between ability and, and willingness that, that does come up practically. And you're, you're, you're resetting the relationship. It's at a new <coughs> firm or you're on your own or whatever, and so it's a new engagement, obviously. And so whether you want to take that person as a client you know, is a question. And that doesn't mean that you don't have all these related ethical obligations to make sure that you handle that in the proper way and that there's continuity and that there's no prejudice and all those things. There may be a rate that they have that they're unwilling to pay more and you're not willing to do the work for that rate in the new firm or personality issues or you don't want to take those types of matters anymore. You're 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 capable, you're competent, but you don't want to you no longer want to do this type of work anymore. I don't want no longer want to do litigation, I want to do advice to counsel or whatever it is. Yeah, so you're not gonna take that client. Yeah, there's lots of reasons. I you know, I could look through this and I think it's an important component of the notice to the client for the client who's we're trying to protect the client, right? For that client to understand whether the departing lawyer is going to be willing to continue the rep representation. Yeah. I think that's a material yeah, fact, not just so whether too. the lawyer is going to be able to do so. But the, that they're the interested part. in doing it. Yeah, right. I mean. I mean, I don't know what other people think. I don't know if it makes it seem too callous, like, well, I'm just not, I mean, maybe that's. I think it's fine. I mean, how you ultimately, <laughs> how you ultimately explain it to the client is separate and apart from this. Absolutely. But I think, I think it's fine the way it's stated here. But what about, um, Andrew's point that, I mean, what do we do? Just some kind of fix to note that. Um, yeah, maybe just that we're applicable. Or, yeah. I mean, what do you think? Because I do, and really, there's also fine. a comment about that the lawyer has the ultimate right to decide who will compete, excuse me, who will complete or continue the representation. Obviously, they don't have the right to choose to go with you if you don't want to take them as a client, right? So, you know, I think these are all things that are important to emphasize in the notice. 
um, and that they should be communicated where where they're appropriate, right? I said, you know, and maybe that's that's um, redundant of another point that was made just about the choice. So that. Um, so it does seem like maybe bullet po the bullet point um, about the client's option to stay, et cetera, is sort of duplicative of the client has the ultimate right. Um, do, do those strike you as distinct in some way? No, I think sometimes we emphasize like we emphasize like hey, these are the choices, and just so you know, you have your choice. It's not our choice. And okay. You yeah. don't be persuaded by. You just need to make the choice. So that's a point that the emphasize typically notices that the client right. lets the client know that they have the ultimate right to choose, and so and that everyone's going to cooperate, notwithstanding their choice, right? So. Um, yeah. But. Okay. I do think that is important. That part. Yeah. So yeah. we leave that. Isn't this the a two. third element? Isn't it the third element? You're, you're letting them know it, it, it's, it's pointing out that it doesn't have to be the departing lawyer or the existing firm. I mean, otherwise, if you just say you have the ultimate choice, it's kind of like a client think, okay, my choice is I can either stay where I am or I can go with the lawyer who's leaving the firm that happened to be the one working on my case. But the reality is they can, they can have it go somewhere else completely. And I, I always thought the opinions kind of focused on telling, or at least letters I've seen, they say something along the lines of, you can stay with us, you can go with the departing lawyer, or you can have your matter, you know, transferred to a lawyer, any, any lawyer of your choice, right. and it has a file request, and one of the options is, you know, fill in the blank where you want it to go, which obviously is not the, the existing firm or the departing lawyer. So I think that third component is important to yeah. me. Yeah, I mean, it could be worded, like, if you don't like that, Choice to, you know, stay with the law firm, go with the departing lawyer to get her new firm, or choose another lawyer. The law firm decided. Did you? I mean, actually, the client has the ultimate right. Is kind of the. Uh, I mean, in a sense, that's duplicative of the. That's what we were just three part discussing. one. Yeah. 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 That's a good, good idea. Where is the client's ultimate right stated in the bullet? It's the last, second to last Second to last. Second to last bullet. Line 2.8. suggestion is to combine that bullet point with uh, the client's option to stay with law firm. Yeah. Well, that's what we were just discussing. I was wondering that. I mean, <laughs> it's something that's re-emphasized, but it's like I don't know, and I maybe I wouldn't necessarily use the word ultimate, and I'm looking at it again because I, yeah, um, it's maybe a little too strong given the fact that we just discussed how they don't. How they right. don't. <laughs> how there's a lot of reasons that they don't, right? So which one do you think about getting rid of? <laughs> how about the client? Yeah. Well. But can or we maybe say we say the client may have the choice to stay with the law. I mean, is may to. Yeah, I like, I like the, the, the two. <laughs> we have drafted. I think it's just a Right to decide who will complete or continue the representation. Well, but how about this? Take that bullet point. The client has the right to decide who will complete or continue the representation, comma, subject to the departing lawyer and law firm's ability and willingness or inability and unwillingness to continue to represent the client. And then delete the client's option to stay with the law firm and then delete the first bullet, the bullet point at 322 of the. Um... But I think that's an important thing to separately tell them. It's not just that 
you know, you have the right subject to that, but to actually communicate whether you're willing or, or uh, able to do it. I mean, but isn't that implicit in the second clause that it's subject to, I mean, the lawyer needs to communicate and the law and or the law firm need to communicate the willingness to continue the representation. Well, which it must communicate to the client or something like that. And I mean, it just, I want to make sure that they know that they need to communicate that information. Does that make sense? Um, well, so how about if you just said, if you, if you are, uh, are we are we thinking that this would now replace the first of the two yellow bullet points? It would replace the uh, first of the two yellow bullet points, and then it would also replace the bullet point that begins at three two two. Oh, sorry. The only point that gets dropped, it looks like, is choose another lawyer or law firm entirely. And you could add that. You could no, add that needs one. to be in there, yeah. I know that needs to be in there. Yeah, no, I think that's cool. And then what about the, what's the other section? And then the standard section. At the risk of adding even more, yeah, and I should shut up. No, do, don't do, shut up. Do we need to add something about following withdrawal? What if, what if the lawyer and law firm don't want the guy, and there's a trial in a month? Do we need to add something about withdrawal? Or subject to 1.16 or something along. That's in there later, I believe. Okay. Then, sorry, I, I, I missed that. And... Is that blue one coming out? Is that the proposal? Yeah. I don't, I don't know. Why do we have to say complete or continue? Do we really need to say both of those? Can we just give some continue? I just now? think maybe we need to take that that one bullet point out. Which one? Which one? That bullet, that Second. right to the side. I mean, I think that we. I think the concept of the client has the choice: to stay with the law firm, go with the starting lawyer, or to choose another lawyer or law firm entirely. That that obviously, you know, and we could say where applicable or something like that. But that I think encompasses the. Right to choose. I, mean, I, I agree with that. Otherwise, the second bullet is incomplete. You, you're, you've left out the third option, yeah, which is, I mean, yeah, I mean, it gets complicated. I, yeah. I, I agree with you. It's just redundant. It's just a point of emphasis, and it doesn't. doesn't. Okay, so now the idea, Mimi, is we're taking out the second yellow highlighted bullet point entirely, except for the footnote needs to stay. <laughs> But no needs to go back to the right. uh, to the other where it was before. Okay. And now we're deleting it? Yeah. Or we need that footnote back. Okay. Can okay. we say instead of the client's option, the client has the choice to stay with the law? Like, yeah, I was thinking I, I really like the option of the yeah. option of this side. Well, option implies that we could actually have a little time to make a decision. Well, has the choice to stay, go, or choose where applicable? How about that? So the 1985-86 opinion uses the language, the attorneys are required to inform the client of the client's right to select either the former firm, the withdrawing attorney, or another lawyer to handle the legal matters and it says in the future, but or another lawyer or law firm, as you say. I'm just raising the point of the client's right to select. I don't know if that. understand why we keep using right so much. Why can't we say they can choose, right? Why did, why did we have to say they have a right to choose? 
I mean, unless it really is a right. Well, right. I mean, it's not a constitutional right or some other <laughs> statutory right. But I do think it, it, it and granted, the 8586 opinion came from, you know, a generation ago. But I think the, it does convey the importance that clients aren't property and it's not the departing lawyer of the law firm's yeah, decision. Like it really resides. For me, that the use of the word right yeah. drives that home. Is it necessary? I'm open. And it's also arguments. actually not accurate because they don't have the the right implies that they can override the lawyer saying well, I can't it's not do it. Absolute, which is what I think we discussed earlier. So, I mean, that's the that's used in all the old cases of the right to choice of counsel on the contract, but it's not absolute because there's like there's a bunch of exceptions, right? So. Right. Correct. I mean, so in your example, you could say, well, I'm going to stick with departing lawyer. They might in, be unable to do it, but they would need to comply with their withdrawing or termination duties notwithstanding that the ultimate end result might still be the same. I can't stay with the person I'm choosing. Um, so I take your point. I can't compel the lawyer to stay with me, but I can require the lawyer to take all those steps. That'd be difficult. But, you know. So should we be putting at the end of the sentence as appropriate? Done that? As applicable? As applicable is what I meant, yeah. <laughs> um, because then that kind of, then we don't have to qualify that in that, you know, the first part of the, as, I don't remember what as applicable. No, I think I think what we need to set do is what Eric said, which is subject to um, the uh, yeah. But I hate to repeat that whole thing. Um, Well, can't this is does this get back to your idea of combining these yes, two? I think, I think it really is better. Yeah. Can you try that? So take um, ability and willing. Yeah. Right, and then you would take the bullet point above out. Yeah, I don't like that because you don't think it tells you that you have to tell the client that. Yeah, huh. and I think it's awesome. okay. Well, then yeah. we have. How about as it is? No. Oh, go back. Yeah, go back. Okay. I mean, as applicable is a little bit un vague. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. I know. What do other people think? <laughs> that they're already married. I personally don't think you need to say subject to again. I mean, you've just said the same thing above. You're taking all these points collectively. This is the notice you're saying. You know, this is the okay. typical type of stuff right. you should put in the notice. Okay. Obviously, you're not going to say, I can't represent you. And by the way, your choice is that you can Yeah, I mean, it just, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I get back to me. The whole ability thing implies that it's, I considered, I always considered the willingness sort of wrapped up in that too. But it's fine to break it out. But I just think. Yeah, we're taking it out. Yeah. Back to work, sir. <laughs> okay. Any, everyone happy with this list, though? Andrew? You're the one who started this. <laughs> um, okay. Um, are there other people who want to... Um, so a couple things. I mean, we could... I'm just not sure what to do with the nitpicky stuff, whether we want to group edit it. Or we want to. Um, does anyone have suggestions on that? I don't know how many nitpicky things there are. It's a very long opinion. Um, I really I like the idea of getting it out. What's that? I think it would be easier for us to put that in the um, Right. So I suppose, can we vote it out and then um, have a red line um, that the group can see for the nits? No, we can't do that. After, so you could um, do it during lunch and then read it off. You could, uh, you you could do that, uh, but I think um, just bring all our typos to Mimi and we'll get them entered in. There are a couple. Um, you know, we could vote it out, subject to Dina and staff reviewing. Um, the departing, the initial caps for departing lawyer issue, and um, typos. Taking any typos, yeah. Non substantive. Right, grammatical, which we would do anyway. 
Um, All right, so that would mean it won't be recirculated for the group to look at again. Well, if you want, we could do that, but it'd have to wait till the April meeting, or we could notice a conference call, but you couldn't do that as a group without a properly noticed meeting. Sorry to raise this, but um, I'm trying to reconcile the bullet point that begins at 278 and the one at 280, where we talk about uh, in 278, the departing lawyer and or departing lawyers and the law firm's ability and willingness or inability and unwillingness to continue to represent the client. Don't we have to at least reference in passing the new law firm's willingness to accept the client? Um, because we refer to it, at least the we refer to the new firm in the next bullet point. And oh, I just that's a different new firm. And that should not be capitalized. Oh, oh no, we do. I'm sorry. I forget what I just said. Yeah. Or, or, or perhaps we could. I mean, the, it's understood that the departing lawyer, I think, is understood that if they're not going to say, you can come with me as an option and I'm willing and able to take you, if they have not cleared that with but their. My firm doesn't want, the new firm doesn't want to. Yeah. Right. So that's, that's a, I mean, part of that conversation is that they've, in this position, typically set it for conflict, but in a position where they can say, I can say to you that this. You can come with me to my new firm because the new firm's already said that they right. can have you. So what my proposal to be uh, or would be to reconcile that is uh, the bullet point that begins at 280, the client may choose to stay with the law firm, go with the departing lawyer, and then delete to her new firm or choose. Yeah. Okay. So I think think where we were going um, uh, is that we are um, going to have a motion to um, approve this opinion for publication subject to uh, Dina and staff working, uh, reviewing it for the initial CAPS question and also any other typos or non-substantive changes. Thought there was a review over the lunch hour. There's Would it be advisable to postpone the motion yeah. until that occurs? Yeah. In the event that someone comes up with some additional, more substantive concern? Yes, I think that's a great idea. Okay, so we're going to postpone any motion and we're going to move on. That was an excellent discussion, and hopefully, uh, before the end of the day, we can uh, look at a slightly revised version um, and, and vote it out. Okay, um, maybe everyone take a, well, how are people doing in terms of hunger level? Because I would love to ask, for us to do 12 triple oh three before lunch, but if we can't, we can't. So raise your hand if you're really hungry. <laughs> Always, just as a general matter. <laughs> no, all right, we're taking, we're taking a break. You could do a working lunch. Uh, yeah, why not? All right, let's have then, to. Uh, but then well, we won't get to read the marijuana. marijuana. Yeah, we're, we're not having a working right. lunch. We're, take, we're taking. Okay, a short We're taking. Lunch. We're taking a 5 0 50 minute lunch and um, uh, try to get back here a little bit before one um, and try to read the marijuana opinion if you haven't. Um, give Dean any changes or Mimi um, on the one we were just working on. Everyone turn off your everyone turn off your mic. Did we I don't have anything to say. Well, so I mean I thought about that. I recall our original charge, or at least you know, the concept for this program was not strictly limited to uh, advising clients in the middle on it. That's what I thought. So so yeah, my, my concern with making it strictly that topic is it, it seems a bit too narrowly focused. Now, you know, what I thought we could do potentially, recognizing that at least I have limited knowledge of the sanctuary city, but, but between the two of us, we could collaborate and 
you know, within, this is like an hour and 15 minutes, is that right? I mean, within the context of the program, maybe devote 15 minutes to that 10, 15 minutes to that topic. One of us could cover that. Yeah, and then um, the bulk of the time would be attributable to the uh, Yes, sorry, thank you.
uh, look at um, the um, ratings website or the directory website opinion 12003, um, and then uh, talk about the marijuana opinion and then circle back to um, the departing lawyer opinion. That's all, unless anyone has any objection. Okay. So, um, Teresa, is she still here or did she have to leave? She, she had to leave. She Darn said. it. Okay. Well, that's all right. She told me she, she didn't want to talk. Yeah. Um, okay. So, this opinion is basically we, the main objective here was just to update it to the new rules because it went out for comment before then. Then there ended up being some changes. Um, and uh, I think we talked about it a little bit at last month's meeting. Um, and, my, and, and the comment I made is that I was not happy with the notion that you, an attorney abandons their profile by deciding to abandon it, because I, don't, I think it's all about what they tell the world, not whatever's in their head. So that change has been made, except that there's a few hanger scragglers that we need to fix to make it consistent. Um, so I can, so that's the only comment I had. Um, and Drew, any comments? No, uh, you and I talked about that. So, um, I have like one typo only because it's like ready to go, I think. Uh, but I don't have any other substantive comments. I mean, this, Larry led this opinion. For those of you that weren't here, it went out at least once, maybe twice. I don't recall. Do you, Andrew? Anyway, it went out for public comments. So the, the goal here, and we had comments and we dealt with those. The goal here was just to update it to the new rules because by the time it came back from public comment, um, we had the new rules or we were about to have the new rules. So the modifications were basically just to make sure we tracked the, the language in the new rule provisions. And there were one or two places um, where something was said twice and maybe we struck where it was said the first time and something like that, little editorial things. But I don't think there's been any material substantive changes to this opinion for uh, several meetings. OK. Anyone, <clears throat> anyone else have any um, uh, comments on this 12003? OK. Oh, Question, mm -hmm. sorry. Um, on line 307, the version I'm looking at, there was an, a note in greater detail below. Someone added a note A1, and I just couldn't see what the note was. That was your comment, I think, Where? about how. So has that, Let me see. Has that point been addressed? Sorry, I've got to find it. Oh, where is the comment? Well, we do discuss oh. it in greater detail below. Don't we have a discussion of abandonment later on? Um, yeah, it's on the next page, basically. <laughs> is that, was oh, that the note? Oh, abandon, uh, yes. Uh, that I was saying. You just can't read what your comment was. I think your comment was probably, I don't like the okay. way we say abandonment. Probably. Um, OK. Uh, because the next section is abandonment of third party right. profile. Is that the? Yeah. I think that, that must have been my comment. Um, cool. OK. Uh, so, Mimi, let me tell you these, these uh, places where this notion of abandoning by mental telepathy happens. Um, <laughs> all right. Uh, Psychic abandonment. Yeah, exactly. Just everyone will know that I've abandoned it. Oh, maybe I marked it in the clean. Um, yeah, so hold on, there's something to go through the clean. Maybe I made my changes there. Okay, so um, it's in the fact section. Um, so the, it starts at line 98. All right, so the first sentence is fine. If you could just strike the second sentence, which is, this means that she has decided to no longer use the profile as a professional marketing tool. If, if everyone's OK with that, I just don't think that's our definition of abandon. Um, uh, so um, and 
uh, so then it would say to demonstrate. I, I don't even think we need that. Yeah. Just take out to demonstrate her abandonment. Okay. Uh, and and I also don't think it's we don't we want to imply that no longer monitoring something is abandonment. I mean that's kind of the opposite. It's not it's not that we want to encourage lawyers not to monitor. I think it would, no, leave in posts. She no longer posts information to it. Removes the link from her professional website. No longer urges clients to view it and post a note. Okay. Um, All right, and then uh, the, in the conclusion at 339. Um, I'm trying to figure out how to do it. I, we want to take out everything after. So uh, where are we? Uh, 339 through 40. Uh, um, sorry, no, the lining, lines have changed. Um, where's the word abandon in the conclusion? It's so 371 of the red uh, okay. line. Okay. Uh, because you're in the red line, that makes sense. All right, so an attorney is not responsible for her profile on an online, online professional directory posted after she has abandoned the profile, period. Take out the by, by deciding to no longer use. Or we could say abandon the profile by no longer using. Just take out by deciding. Um, yeah, I think that's fine. Um, Hold on, yeah. but then do you think it's such a decision? Okay. An attorney has decided, uh, well, no, because we use the word decision in that sentence. An attorney has decided to abandon. I mean, we oh, could okay. take it out. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. That's it for me. Um, anything? Anyone? Okay. I got just one oh, or two yeah. right. real quick nets. Um, I, I have them on the, the red line. Um, so on the red line, um, line 259 is the end of this uh, paragraph, ends but being unable to implement them. You got it right. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Right. Okay, so this is just one quick question. Um, a page later, on 307, we uh, we dropped this 309. We dropped this footnote about Hassel versus Bird. This is the case, you know, you might not be able to make the internet provider take it down. Um, and we talked about that. People wanted that in. My only comment is, I wondered if conceptually it made sense to move footnote 14 to that at the end of them, because this is where we first introduced this concept that you know you could have an ethical duty to correct. But be in this conundrum because you can't, you don't have sort of the practical, physical ability to get it corrected. So it just seemed to me that that might be a logical place. I don't care that much, but it, it would just be moving footnote 14 to come after at the end of that paragraph. <clears throat> and then in that, oh, okay. Sure. Um. I mean, right now it's it's at the end of a paragraph that says, finally, as we discussed in greater detail below, another option the attorney should at least consider when faced with inaccurate factual information that cannot be corrected on a rating yours website. Is yeah, yours is much better. It just seems like, like we're getting this. Yeah, so. Yeah. Don't move any. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so in that number two, uh, oh, just... Below it, there was a, st it starts enumerating one and two. Yeah, right there, in two. This is just a typo. 
any inaccurate information, comma, and, uh, and strike any. So, and an appropriate disclaimer. Um, and then just jumping over to the very last line before the conclusion, which is on mine is 339. Uh, let me just see if it's... So, posting... Okay, hold on. here attorneys posting. I think of which is stricken after posting should be back in. Here attor attorneys posting of a notice that she is no longer using. Or maybe <coughs> I don't know. here attorneys posting a notice. That, I, okay, that's fine. That's just my grammar goofiness. That that's it. So just leave it. Yeah. That's how I have. This would be for submission to the Board of Trustees, right? Uh, no, it's additional public comment because it's the first time the opinion has been revised to update to the new rules. So that's a substantive change, so it needs an additional public comment. I think only actually brought out the public comment one time. Oh. Actually, it just felt like, like twice. It doesn't, it does, but there's no change in the substance of the analysis at all. Well, uh, there's it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same analysis. Right, but the standard, the advertising rules are markedly different than it was under 1400. I mean, that's a substantial change. We're analyzing um, those new rules for the first time. Uh, the public. Do you want to get a new let another letter from the Scott? The public <laughs> needs to be uh, have the opportunity yeah. to, to look at how we're interpreting. Ahead of the. No longer there. Oh, really? Yeah, well, we uh, have her. Yeah, uh, I understand your point. Uh, yes, Amber. <laughs> Can we, if it's going out for public comment, is that what's happening? Yes. <clears throat> Can I uh, point out a couple of typos? Oh, absolutely. Sure. Well, and Justin has some comments too. He's oh, oh. But, but go ahead. I'll go after you. No problem. Okay. So. Now it's going for public comment. <laughs> 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 right. Exactly. All right. Um, so it's. I'm looking at the red line version, line ten. However, if the attorney chooses to exercise, oh. see that. Uh, and um, line 86. So we use websites, apostrophe S, administrators, and website administrators kind of throughout inconsistently. I think it should just be website administrators without the apostrophe S. And so there is one instance of apostrophe S on at line 86 and one at 87. Oh, and we might want to just do a quick search just to make sure we cut every one of them. I, I actually thought it was weird that we made it plural. I mean, I just. Uh, administrators, right. right. You know Should we make it administrator? I mean, how, why would we assume that there's more than one? Make it singular. Um, okay, in line 126. Well, that's the thing that we didn't want to do. We're not taking notes as we keep repeating. Yeah, just singular. Okay. Okay. Um, yes. I'm going to call it straight in for one week. Oh, um. Um, line 20, 126. Uh, sentence that see, testimonial about or endorsement of the lawyer may be misleading if presented so as to if there is an extra two so as to two um, line one no sorry line 213. I think we need a period before the um, quotation mark. And then line 
221, the criteria for calculating the rating on the site are, not is. And then in footnote nine, the very last line. Mm -hmm. We need a space between between the end of the citation and the word on. And then I have a couple more. Um, 241, comment number four to rule 71 notes. We need comments before and after, however. And uh, line 270, bullet point two, any inappropriate disclaimer. Oh, did we read that? Okay, sorry, missed that. Um, and then two ninety. However, with electronic web pages. To, um, there should be a comma after however. Okay. And footnote 13, you need to add a space between also and the name of the case in Ray, or in the matter of. Before, okay. before C, I guess, as long as you're there. Before C, okay. yeah. Okay. So C and then so move. Okay. That's it. <clears throat> um, okay, so Justin and then Toby. Uh, just a few things. <clears throat> On the, uh, in the digest, I'm wondering if we want to be parallel in our following statements at line 20 we, we talk about um, inducing another post content that is false misleading or deceptive but then 33 we only talk about misleading um, I don't know if that was just an oversight or if there's a difference um, you in the red line? I'm in the red line sorry you said so at line 33 do we want do we also want to use that same language and say uh, um, you know an attorney who abandons a profile on a third-party directory has no further obligation to correct false, misleading, or deceptive content to be parallel with 20, line 20, where we use that same phrase. Um, it's actually, well, on that point, the new rule just says false or misleading. Deceptive has been removed. Right, so then do we want to strike deceptive? Yeah. I would. Sure. I was looking at line 33, but I'm uh, I think we should start at line 20 because the first time it appears. I would say false or misleading. And then should we use that same phrase on line 33, I think is just this point. Yeah. yeah, except you you have 6157.1, which hasn't changed, which has all three. That's okay. probably the way. Okay. So, so go back <laughs> and undo those last two changes. And then so what Justin's saying is we need to add the other <coughs> false, comma, misleading, comma, or deceptive. That's in the spell. Yeah, I know. <laughs> My brain is so quick. Okay. Should I do a search to make sure? Yeah. Oh, I should make a I'll just make a note to make sure that it's um, And then on, in the sort of 311 to 320 area, we're talking about how the attorney was required to abandon the profile under the stated facts. Uh, there was, you know, an, an inaccurate testimonial. Uh, and, and we're saying that um, <clears throat> that abandonment am ameliorates any misleading effect of the client's inaccurate 
testimonial. I, I think maybe I'm a little too deep in the facts here, but when I read that and we're saying, okay, well, by abandoning the profile, everything's good in terms of the, the inaccuracy of this testimonial and it's not um, attributable to the attorney as some kind of false or misleading statement, but out there again, I'm in the facts. This same lawyer uh, had a relative post some kind of fraudulent testimonial. So there just seemed to me like uh, a bit of a disconnect. We're saying, oh, that we're blessing the lawyer's abandonment of the profile with respect to this inaccurate testimonial, but there's still this false, clearly false um, statement by a relative out there. And I don't know if that struck other people as sort of like a, a bit of a, a discord there. And I don't know if it warrants some kind of footnote to say we're not, we're not trying to suggest there's any excuse um, or amelioration with respect to the other aspects of this fact pattern, which are fairly extreme. Um, but that that's something that struck me at least. And put it another way, if the lawyer abandons the profile because of this inaccurate, the lawyer's really great and ethical about trying to abandon because of this inaccurate testimony, all the while the same lawyer has used a relative to post a fraudulent um, encomium, um, there's just a discord for me there. I can't decide whether you're saying you don't. You think our advice is suggesting something No, I think the advice is, is correct. Or you're saying you don't like our narrative. I'm saying I'm, I, I got a little, I, I try not to get stuck in the facts, but I was reading this. I was like, well, wait a minute, Koprak. You have this fact pattern with various, you know, scenarios involving the same lawyer, as I understood it, in the same profile. And we're saying it's okay to abandon um, the should should abandon because of those this inaccurate testimonial and this lawyer's done all the right things to try to abandon it but at the same time the same lawyer on the same profile has a relative make a, a fraudulent statement about the lawyer's services or quality or, or what have you there just seemed to be a like I said a, a discord there and I'm wondering if we need a footnote saying look you know we're, we're talking about the, the part of this scenario that deals with the inaccurate testimonial and it was absolutely appropriate for the lawyer to abandon after taking various steps that were ineffective to remove the inaccurate testimonial. But that is not in any way suggesting um, that it would be appropriate for that same lawyer to maintain or allow to be maintained in this profile this um, clearly fraudulent statement of a relative. So first of all, the, the facts actually aren't that the lawyer abandons the website because of the inaccurate posting. The facts are that the lawyer thick deals with that by posting her own disclaimer, his own disclaimer, and then later gets bored of the website. So okay, yeah. So, but I take your other point. Um, we have just so, sort of. Um, it's like the the it's like the lawyer's Jekyll and Hyde. Um, you well, know? Yeah, I know, but I mean, I guess that doesn't bother me. But what bothers me is that you're right that we are suggesting that some there is a sort of implicit suggestion that um, that the 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 lawyer has cleansed the actual culpable act, which is weird. I agree with you there. I'm not suggesting this needs like some massive factual restructuring. I'm just wondering if we need like a clarifying footnote even just to say, look, <laughs> we're not forgiving or suggesting that there, there's anything uh, that's been ameliorated with respect to that other aspect of this fact pattern. <clears throat> um, well, I think to me, the, oh, there's only one sentence in this, in this section five that actually addresses the fact patterns as opposed to sort of opining on the just conduct generally. And it's the very last sentence where we say, here, attorneys attorney's posting of a notice that she's no longer using it, et cetera, et cetera, should be sufficient to demonstrate her abandonment of it. So that's the sentence that would create the problem, right? 
Yes, and, and, and again, for me, I think it's um, the suggestion that abandoning um, in, in any way could ameliorate what, at least as I read the facts a couple days ago, um, would still be a, a profile that has this you know, fraudulent relative testimonial. I think that's still a problem. And you know, could we have structured it differently where we had hypothetical A, hypothetical B, different you know, testimonials or different um, issues going on with the profile, sure. But since we haven't done that, and I'm not trying to propose a massive restructuring, I, I just think that it would be helpful to the reader to confirm we're not in any way um, ignoring or, or forgiving um, that what I think is a fairly, frankly, egregious aspect of this fact pattern, having the relatives. Well, and, we, and we say that. I mean, we say that, that it's... Um, that it violates 7.1 and 6.57 and is probably more per turpitude as well. I mean, so exactly, and that's why I'm struggling with this discord because right. um, on the one hand we say that, but then on the other hand we're, we're focusing on this other part of the, what, the fact pattern. What, what if at the end of the part that Amy was just citing where we say here attorneys posting, if I notice she's no longer using or monitoring it, her actions and no longer referring clients to it or referring to it on our site should be sufficient to demonstrate our abandonment of it. We drop a footnote and say, you know, such abandonment would be appropriate and consistent with respect. I mean, somehow how reference back the the false post. I mean, but wouldn't we say it's not a cure? Wouldn't we say this abandonment does not cure the prior? Oh yeah, um, no, you're prior. right. You say uh, deceptive conduct. Right. Is, right. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, kind yeah, of what you're yeah. asking. Yeah, that's right. Exactly. That's right. So okay. we're making it very clear, hey, lawyers, you know, you can't create or help manufacture a false and misleading testimonial and do some, you know, the right thing with respect to some other aspect well, of your profile, you and then that's forgiven. This abandonment would not cure the violations of section such, such right. and such. And, right. Something yeah. along those lines. Okay. I think yeah. So footnote at line... <clears throat> 339 in my... That's a good point. Jekyll and Hyde. <laughs> <laughs> 342. Sorry, the very end of the, right. the text, yeah. So we want to footnote there. And it says, should say, um, abandoning the third-party profile would clearly not cure uh, um, fraud. Let me just read this. Uh, The viol any violation of Rule 7.1 by, know um, by knowingly posting false or misleading information on a profile or causing others to do so. Yeah. Or do you want to say 7.1 and 6157.1? Yeah. Um, or maybe we just take out the rules. Not uh, cure... cure um, uh, any knowing posting, yes, to take out violation of Rule 7.1. Cure any, take out the K, oh. take out the by, cure an attorney's having knowingly posted Or caused, mm -hmm. or caused, uh, or caused others to have done so. I hate this length. I hate this wording, but to have done so, and we can see if we can fix that. Cure. Um, yeah, that's good. Uh, so you can make it into a rather than any lawyer. So it would not 
clearly would not cure a Mm -hmm. Cure. Uh, so this is the standing third party protocol would clearly not cure an ethical violation resulting in harm. <coughs> a lawyer. Fine. Was it? Are we curing the coaching? Or are we curing? No, it's a violation. We said it's a violation, point blank, in the earlier section. Yeah. So. Not cure the ethical violation. So I, I guess the, the only question remaining for me on this, because again, I was stuck in the facts of this particular opinion, is do we do we want to or do we not want to? I don't have a strong feeling. Refer back to the the hypothetical here. So, so we make this comment, such as with respect to the hypothetical posed, you know, about attorneys, sisters, fictitious testimony or something like that. I don't know. What do you think? I mean, I think it kind of brings it home in, in terms of, you know, otherwise it's sort of an abstract statement and it kind of makes it clear that we're referring back to this, as I've put it before, this sort of discord in the facts here. Um, um, the, the Jekyll and Hyde lawyer. Um, I mean, I... I, I I like bringing it back to the hypothetical because that's what I got stuck on. But I, you know, that's my individual uh, reaction to this section of the opinion. So others might not feel strongly. And Go to knowingly posting rather than having knowingly posting. Posting knowingly, I guess so. Uh, we could just, what if we just ended it um, as in our hypothetical? That's fine. Yeah. I think that brings it home. <laughs> Very end of the sentence, as in our hypothetical. I think I, I don't think we need the on the lawyer's behalf. I, mean, we know, I think that's implicit in causing others to have done so. Um, I mean, like, can you say causing others to do so? Um, we've gotten rid of the has, right? And now I, I think we um, we need some sort of punctuation between the so and the has. What it should be. Comma. Comma? Okay. Anyone? So you mean if, if we say as in this? That would be good. I think that would be fine. Okay. I just had one other comment. In the conclusion, at what was at least uh, 354, 355, it says attorneys should avoid using ratings issued for a price. Um, I didn't see it, and maybe I missed it. If we talk about that earlier in the opinion, we do. We do. Okay. The long span. Okay, I just, big... I just missed it. Yeah. It put you to sleep. <laughs> Sorry. I said it put you to sleep. Well, it could have been my I... my Dayquil affecting my <laughs> impairing me. Um, then, then I have no qualms with that. Those who are awakened at two a.m. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Between Southwest and Bakewell. <laughs> yes. A quick knit here on line 127. Reasonable person to form an unjustified 
expectation. Remove. Remove. <laughs> okay. Remove subject to the that to further to be set out for further public comment. Second. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's have a look. Let's go. Oh, we got to do it. We got to do it. It's okay. Oh, we're okay. Two selects. All right. Um, Amy. Yes. Stephen. You did voice one. Yes. Kendra. Yes. David. Yes. Eric. Yes. Justin. Yes. Matt. Yes. Toby. Yes. Adam. Yes. Amber. Yes. Dina. Yes. Sharisa. Richard. Yes. Stephen. Yes. Marshall. Thank you. So. All right. Thanks, everybody. Yay. Okay. Great job. Um, now on to. The new opinion, uh, 17001, advising uh, client about marijuana. Um, Kendra and Steve, hit it. All right. Um, so since the last meeting, Two things uh, that the substantive thing that Kendra and I did, Kendra organized a meeting with the uh, uh, with the uh, cannabis committee of the, uh, uh, the Bar Association of San Francisco, um, and uh, that was very helpful. I thought, and it actually some of it sometimes it shows up in this opinion, in the form of some of the things that the client wants the uh, uh, lawyer to do. And I think that that's actually an area we could use some more consultation with them on because we, I don't think we have a very clear sense of all the ways in which cannabis lawyers may be asked to do things that other lawyers aren't necessarily asked to do um, that they might need help with. Um, so uh, we tried to take, I tried to take some of the learning from that meeting uh, in, into the uh, uh, opinion. But mainly what I wanted to do in this drafting process, and Kendra is uh, absolved of all errors here, because I was working essentially between our meeting, which was last week and this week, to try and get something to us, um, uh, was to set out the argument uh, for how uh, 1.21 works. I mean, we outlined it before. Um, and this is really trying to explain uh, what 1.21 means and what comment 6 means and what it allows and doesn't allow or where the line falls um, in thinking about that. The, probably the thing that I would highlight in the analysis is um, the uh, a proposition that um, uh, is trying to find a line for what it means to assist in interpreting or complying. Right? Does that literally mean that if there's no interpretation or compliance problem, you can't assist? Right? Um, and the, the conclusion they, that that's something that cannabis lawyers are very worried about. Um, and so one goal in this opinion was to try and sketch what a line might mean that it would give you some scope to do things like that don't really have a, an overt compliance issue in them, uh, but are part of what a normal business lawyer does, as opposed to things that aren't don't really have anything to do with what a normal business lawyer does, but could be construed as assisting, like for example, setting up a rainy day fund for your client in your client trust account or something like that. That could be assisting, but not. Anyway, that's a, that's the line that's suggested here. Um, this, the other two things that ha uh, the opinion does differently, one is it actually tries to summarize what the sort of state of federal and state law is, uh, uh, more as background than anything else. Uh, but I think that the, um, the important takeaway for me, because this is all new to me, is that the way California law works, um, 
the goal is to try and get everybody into the system. Everyone in the system is supposed to be permitted, right? And, and every transaction in marijuana is supposed to be between people who have permits, right? And the way that it works is that if you're in the system and you're permitted and you're in compliance, right, then you're not guilty of a crime under California law. And you can't be have your assets seized under California law. But if you venture beyond that safe harbor, right, then you are, uh, then you are guilty of a California crime. So there's a, the point, I think, is to, that there's really an important issue for a lawyer in being in compliance with California law as a matter of California law, it's not all about federal law, right? There's a precipice you can go off under California law that can open you up, um, uh, and that's one of the reasons you need to get advice about it. Um, the last thing I would say uh, is um, that Kendra and I talked about uh, trying to condense the sort of disclosure points a little bit into some more basic things, what you'd have to do with respect to privilege and confidentiality, what might fall under the heading of things that would give rise to a potential conflict that you might have to disclose, uh, and so forth. And uh, the back end is a very rough attempt to get at those uh, propositions, uh, by no means final, I think, very much subject. To, uh, and with that, I'll, uh, so I'm open to everything. Uh, Kendra has, uh, I'm sure, has comments and thoughts uh, based on our discussions and her reading of the new draft. But, yeah. Yeah, it was very well done, uh, especially the explanation of state law and federal law. Um, our meeting was very insightful. I mean, um, we learned a lot. and. And, and learned a few things that I think we weren't really anticipating. Um, we had had some questions that we had given to them ahead of time, and we certainly got um, a lot more information back than we expected. I think that we need to develop the end of the opinion, which talks about the disclosures, um, which is something Steve and I have talked about before, but some of my comments are maybe just to relay the information we received from these cannabis lawyers and get a feel from the group, whether it's something that should be included in an ethics opinion um, or how we can address it. So I have, you know, some um, really basic comments and, and just, um, you know, some typos and things like that. But I'll give that to you later, Steve, sure. so that we can look at some of the bigger stuff. Yeah. So one thing I noticed is in our original draft outline, we discussed competence, and I don't think that it's in this draft. Um, and one of the things that these cannabis lawyers mentioned to us is, unlike many other areas of the law, this one in particular changes constantly, and right now is changing at a very fast pace. So competence was something that was important to them. Um, the lawyers we met with are obviously very conscientious and very aware of their ethical obligations. And I got the sense in our meeting that they were a little annoyed with other lawyers, their counterparts, who aren't as well aware of these things. Um, so that was one thing they brought up, is that you know, it, within the duty of competence, they are expected to keep up with the current state of the law. And as um, Steve did a great job pointing out in here that also involves the current state of the federal law as well because that's something that they're required to advise them on and any conflicts that exist between state and federal law. So I think we should add that in there. I, I um, totally agree. Where Thank we you. put it, you know, is, is another question. So adding competence in there. Um, Another point that was brought up was, you know, we had talked about the last time the trust account issues, insurance issues, which we learned from these attorneys isn't as much of an issue as we thought. 
Um, these attorneys have been able to get trust accounts um, from various banks or credit unions, which are IALTA accounts approved by the California Bar, which is great news. Um, and they also, um, you know, have been able to get insurance. What was unclear to me in our talk, and I don't know that the lawyers actually knew this, is whether the insurance that they had um, had provisions that exempted them for certain, you know, criminal actions or things like that, which would obviously be a, a part and parcel of the type of law that they're practicing. So I think one thing that might be helpful to include and one thing that they had asked us to include is that when these attorneys are applying for insurance, when they're applying for an IOLTA account, they must be very transparent in what their, you know, the details that they're giving to the insurance companies and the banks as to the kind of money that is going to go into these accounts. So I think the transparency issue is something we should bring up. I, um, I, I totally agree with that too. I tried to work that through in certain, but not, not with respect to those issues. And right. I think it, it's important because you're right. One of the things that I remember one of them saying is, um, you know, one of the reasons I don't worry about whether I'm insured is that I've been completely truthful with my insurance company about what I'm doing. Right. I, I've, I've been absolutely clear about what the nature of my business is. Um, we, I think they'll be stopped, essentially, from denying right. coverage given, given uh, how explicit I've been with them. So I think that, that general theme of being transparent yeah. with, you know, in getting insurance and in getting your bank accounts, um, that's something that we should mention. But also, and this is a question for the group, so, uh, you know, under Rule 1.4.2, you have to tell a client if you don't have insurance. What strikes me as being a particularly big issue in this field of law especially is that under most liability policies there are a lot of exceptions that could exclude the work being done by these attorneys. Do we think that these attorneys have an obligation to tell the clients that you know I have insurance but it's possible that my work for you could be excluded? I know it doesn't explicitly say that in the rule, but do we think that that falls under there and should we include that in our opinion? Um, so that's one question to think about. Um, let's see. Um, sure. Um, the duty to tell the bank the type of clients you have or the type of money you have. The theory behind that obligation is it's client protective because should the bank learn about it later, it might have negative consequences for the client. I'm curious the rationale and the thinking. I'm not saying I disagree with it. I just, I'm just curious uh, well, I mean, why. Just the, in general, it's a risk for the bank to take that money under federal law. Right. Um, and so I think just generally the bank should know the type of risk that they're taking on. Um, also those assets can be seized under federal law. Right. Um, so. Isn't that a bank compliance? Well, if you're not telling them, <laughs> if you're not upfront with them as to where the money will be coming, um, you know, maybe it's some way you could get in trouble if the bank says, well, we had no idea that this money, the source of this money was from Kendra. You know, I, 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 I wonder, I mean, I really hear you about transparency, and I think it's a weakness of this draft that it doesn't fully implement. But, it, it, but Andrew's question is a good one. I mean, those aren't client-regarding reasons for transparency, or not necessarily yeah. so. Well, the, and they the were, insurance one. The, the, the insurance one clearly yeah. is. The bank one, not so clearly. Well, Certainly if you're asked by the bank, I w would agree. You gotta, yeah, so this is, this is something I want to flesh out, because yeah. I think, you know, the trust account, for example, that's something that they're required to have. Would there ever be an issue where the money going into that trust account is money received from, you know, cannabis suppliers, providers, that somehow, some way, um, they would lose the ability to have that account and that would reflect on their ethical obligations? Might there be a tie-in under 4.1b? 
I don't know, but so 4.1, in the course of representing a client, a lawyer shall not knowingly be fail to disclose a material fact to a third person, I guess the bank, when disclosure is necessary to avoid assisting a criminal or fraudulent act by the client, unless disclosure is prohibited by 6068E or 1.6, you might need the client to allow you to make that disclosure. Mm -hmm. But then wouldn't the duty of competence compel you to advise the client of this obligation um, and explain the consequences if the client doesn't give that consent? I don't mean to type the conversation. No, I was just I, it, I was just curious the statement you are obligated to tell the bank what you're doing and I again not opposed to that. I was well, just I curious if we I'm could asking. clearly state so the reasons why. Would there be a situation and I don't know. Would there be a situation where if you didn't disclose to the bank the type of money and and most of these attorneys we talk to this is all they do. I mean the, mm -hmm. all of their income is from, you know, the, these type of sources. Would there be a situation where if they didn't disclose it to the bank and the bank found out about it, then they would lose those accounts and then be in violation of their ethics rules? Because isn't that what you're asking? Like, how is this tied into the ethics rules and whether or not we need to include it in the opinion? Okay. I don't know, but. Yeah, just a, cou a, couple, a couple of observations. Um, both in applying for my own client trust accounts and in assisting other lawyers to apply for a client trust account, as far as I know, no bank has ever inquired as to well, what is the nature of your practice, what are, what are going to be the nature of the funds to be deposited into the account. So I don't know, I mean, maybe that's changed since you know, the last few years. But as far as I know, the banks don't really ask those questions. I mean, you're sitting there in the bank with your, you know, new accounts person. I mean, the banks generally don't understand client trust accounts anyway. I, I'm not sure the banks are savvy enough to see an issue there, and I've never heard of it, a bank ever asking those questions. So the question, now the question becomes, well, now the bank's not asking you, should right. you somehow volunteer this information? Uh, the bank then says, well, gee, we don't know. I don't think we're going to let you open a client trust account. And now you've got a situation where you're going to be holding client funds, well, potentially asked to hold client funds, but there's no right. bank will give you a client trust account. And that's how this came up. Right. Because there are some banks that won't accept it. So these attorneys have gotten into the practice of, I'm just going to tell them up front what I'm doing so that I can get an account because I know under the rules I need one. Okay. So that's the way that they kind of worked through the different banks to figure out who would take it and who wouldn't take it, and, and they just wanted to. So do some that. banks have given them have said, right. "Well, we don't care." Right. There are we essentially some, don't some care. Some banks were credit unions, is what there were credit unions that provided the trust accounts, and the bar okay. has approved right. those. State chartered, did you know? Um, state there were there were state chartered, there were nationally chartered, and then there were credit unions. Um, and I believe the attorneys you were talking to had their trust accounts through credit unions, right, Steve? No, I, yeah. I, I had an I, impression you couldn't. Some of them had been advanced. Yeah, I think. but there are banks that will flat out not accept that right. money because of the federal laws. And so these attorneys, rather than get in a situation where, you know, they find okay. out after the fact and the money gets seized um, and, you know, possibly other laws that are broken. So they provide uh, some they, kind of written disclosure to the bank. I think it's just a matter of just making sure that okay. you know the banks are aware of what they're getting themselves into, and the attorneys know they have a safe place to go that's um, okay. meeting the requirements under their ethical obligations. I, I feel like it's something we have to put in there, but I don't know how to weave it in. I guess is what it comes down to. I mean, the the you know the rules of the trust accounts, and then why that would be important in this particular scenario. But it sounds like it's not a requirement that the bank be told. It's just the best practice for the lawyer to let the bank know, uh, you know, my clients are engaged in certain activities, marijuana-related businesses, and I, we, I want to make disclosure to you, the bank, that this client trust account is going to be used to hold, I guess, client funds either advanced client funds or settlement funds. Yeah, I mean, I guess there could be a situation where the bank doesn't ask 
they get it. They sneak it in there. Don't and ask, then, don't then, tell. Then yeah. there are problems later on. I don't know. And maybe that's something we need to flush out more is what are the problems down the road. Um, yeah. I, I want to say that I, to my mind, when I heard <coughs> this very bright and engaging attorney say that his approach was transparency, I didn't understand him necessarily to be speaking in, in client regarding terms necessarily. Right. Uh, I understood him to be, uh, or at least I, I understood, and this as working through the argument of the opinion made me feel this more as well, that uh, non-concealment is sort of built into 1.2.1. Right. Right. Uh, there's a there's a kind of a non-concealment policy almost. That's true. Yep. Uh, in uh, 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 that the whole premise of 1.2.1 is that we're above board about this. Mm -hmm. Feds come get us if you want to, right? Uh, that's your choice. But we're not we're not obstructing you. Uh, we're not we're not concealing what we're doing. Well, and right, and also they talked about how under the money laundering um, statutes, there's that concealment element as well. If you're found to have concealed funds from um, cannabis, then you, you could be found guilty for money laundering. So that was a part of that discussion as well, too, is that they don't ever want to be put in that position where they're concealing something. So perhaps that's where we can put it in is under – Concealing point, from the bank or concealing from the federal government? Right, from the federal government, under the federal money laundering rules. It would be nice to have some input. I don't know if this is possible or obtainable. I don't know if the banks would give us this information. Some information on what the typical, if there is a typical sort of bank process for evaluating. I don't know if that information is, I don't know if the banks would tell us. I don't know if uh, we, you know, can we ask them? It, but it's an interesting issue because I don't, sounds like there's inconsistency on the part of the financial institutions. Some will take a risk, some won't take a risk. Well, I mean, when these attorneys that we were talking to walk in the door of a bank and they say, you know, I want to open these accounts for my law office. Right. I, I'm, you, I assume the bank's going to say, oh, what kind of law do you practice? Or there's at least that initial question. But if not, these attorneys I, certainly felt like they had to tell them. I, no, I've, never heard, I've never heard of a bank asking that question, but yeah. maybe this is a case where the, they do have to volunteer. Or maybe they're now, at, during these times, much more heightened to it. So yeah. they're, they're starting to ask those questions. I don't know. But these lawyers came right out and said that they, right. they gave the information to the bank. Interesting. Um, and I'm sure there are some that don't. Oh, yeah. But That's, you know, the, if I don't have to disclose it, why would I? If right. It, there's a risk, I won't, uh, they won't open an account for me. Right. Um, so somehow, some way, I just feel like the trust account issue and the insurance issue should be put in there, um, you know, and maybe under this umbrella of transparency, and maybe we can work that into the 1.2.1. But something for the group to think about. Um, the other thing that we had mentioned in our prior draft were confidentiality rule 1.6 and business and professions code 6068E1. And I thought maybe we should throw that in under the potential unavailability of the privilege. That's more to come. Okay. There's, a, there's a bracketed okay. section there. I didn't feel I could. Yeah. Yet I, I didn't feel I could do justice in the time that was available to the yeah. question. So I, think of, some, I wasn't even sure how far we should go with it. You know? um, uh, do we, it's, it's a little bit like the problem we were talking about this morning of what to do about confidentiality in the context of mm -hmm. um, uh, moving law firms and checking conflicts. It's almost like a separate opinion in, in itself. But maybe there's some authority out there already on how attorneys should resolve those kinds of conflicts. Where yeah, and I think because we're we sitting in a state a where our confidentiality mm -hmm. rules are so much, you know, more strict than everywhere else. We don't have an exception for court orders. 
Right. On the other hand, are we serious that somebody who's got a prosecutor looking him in the face saying you're actually guilty of assisting in a federal crime if you don't and you don't have the privilege, I'm going to put you in contempt and I'm going to indict you. Right. And these and these attorneys <laughs> that person we spoke has to, to uh, but at they all said peril. they will not reveal the what? information. They what? would be arrested. They would be held in contempt because they're not going to reveal the information based on their ethical obligations in California. Right. And and there's this other hammer right. sitting there, which is that they're guilty of a federal crime. Right. Um, uh, it's uh, it's a hard one. Anyway, I do want to say I do think we should say more about it. Sure. Okay. And. Um, this is kind of a minor comment, but on page 9, around 285, I just think in the beginning of that paragraph under Roman numeral number 3, we should say something along the lines of, as previously stated, Rule 1.2.1, Comment 6, requires that if California law conf conflicts with federal law and tribal law, the lawyer must inform the client about the law and the policies, blah, blah, blah. We've quoted it before. Um, and it says, under certain circumstances, Got may it. be required to provide legal advice to the client regarding the yeah. conflict, and then go into what you said. Right. I do. Th I, I, I want to raise this for the group. When, especially given the way the privilege works, and given the current state of the law, assuming I've got it right, mm -hmm. which I'm, I'm not, which I'm reasonably confident I've got the basic contours anyway, mm -hmm. right? When would you ever be able not to give that advice under one point? Where, I mean, I don't quite understand when you could ever, uh, get, especially given the risk that you're going to blow the privilege, mm -hmm. uh, when, when do you ever not give that advice? Well, and my other point to this, and this goes back to confidence again, so you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of conflicts that come up between state and federal law in this regard. And there are a lot of lawyers that may not be competent in all of those areas. So I think we need to throw in there some type of sentence, which I think we had in our last draft, that you know, if they are unable to give certain advice on certain areas, whether it be, I don't know, um, taxes or something, that they should you know, advise that they see something else. I, I completely agree that so, competence so we need to throw to go that back in, and that yeah. there should be a good discussion of that in the next right. in the next draft. But I'm curious. I'm just curious. I mean, the way that that comment is written, it suggests it's optional to advise about the conflict, but I don't actually see how it could ever be optional. Well, it says they must inform the client, and then it says may in the next sentence, which is yeah. odd. But what line? We're talking about the it's comment not, six. It's not in there. Six. But well, we had put comment six in earlier. I think it should be we should reiterate it there, um, right before. That's fine. Good. Go into that. Um, okay. Let's see if I have anything else. I think the Supreme Court is just like me; they just want wiggle room because they think we're not <laughs> capable of thinking of every situation. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's that, and I think the May is. With respect to the competence issue, if it raises a federal conflict of federal law on a federal law topic that you're not competent on advising, oh, it's almost like a nickel topic. versus Keller. Um, I mean, I'm raising it for you. You might want to get your own counsel on, you know, how to defend yourself in federal criminal court. Right. Uh, I can't. You know, I'm just the local ordinance That's cannabis true. guy. That's a really. Uh, I think that's yeah, part so of, and there may be a whole wide range of issues. No, I think that's a really exactly. good point, and one of the interesting things was. And if you are competent, then the may would kick in. You should provide that. And so these we folks, a, these folks are very accompli a, very sensitive to that line. Mm -hmm. um, you know, many of them are representing people who used to only be represented by criminal defense lawyers. <laughs> We had, so we had a kind of a catch-all sentence in our outline, I believe, that addressed that issue of, you know, if you're not competent in right. all of these, you know, intersecting areas of the law that you should advise them to seek other counsel or something. Right. So hope we can probably that plug that That can easily back come in. back in. I'm yeah. not worried about that. Um, so the other interesting thing that came up, and it's something that we discussed the last time, was 
under these circumstances, do uh, attorneys that practice in this area accept alternative currencies? Um, and these attorneys said absolutely not. You do not take alternative currencies and you do not accept any client that has offshore banking. And again, this was all about um, if they were you know, withholding information or somehow concealing uh, information that they would be penalized under federal law. So they didn't want to be put in any type of situation where they were concealing where the money was going. And, and it also, under state law, there are certain you know, requirements you have to meet to actually comply with state law. So um, now, sure, there are attorneys in California that do accept all of that, but they thought that was an important point that we should include as well is, you know, and maybe that's just a one sentence that you know, there is um, that accepting alternative currencies or working with companies with offshore bank accounts, you know, could be seen as um, concealing. I, I think that this whole theme of concealment comes up in, in both right. of the examples that are discussed in the opinion. Right. And maybe what we just want to do, I mean, I, one organizational point I, I, I'd like to already see as wanting to make is to put the whole discussion out there and then discuss all right. of these hypothetical type situations at the back, right? Right. So that, um, uh, and that allow, will allow us to kind of thematize a little better, I think, too. Right, and, and you brought up in, in this draft, um, which was another thing that these lawyers mentioned to us, is one of the ways that things are being concealed by some lawyers in this industry is instead of actually accepting money from their clients, they're you know, trading and getting a stake in the business. And for the most part, although we know that that's allowed in some circumstances, under the circumstances of this type of law, it's specifically being done to conceal. Um, and so that's one way that they're trying to do that. What and do you Steve that brought that up. Okay, what are they trying to conceal? Just so there isn't money changing hands. Um, and so they can hopefully get more of a stake out of the business. Um, so which also brings up a whole host of conflict issues. Um, and I think, Steve, you went into that a bit in that particular rule of. I didn't go into all the detail. I tried to sketch what, what I thought some right, of the considerations. Right, right, right. Well, when you say a stake in the business, uh, like it's a, a percentage ownership, an equity interest yeah. of some mm -hmm. kind, which would normally trigger. Well, it's old 3 300, new 1.8.1. 1.8.1. Mm -hmm. So that's one, that's one line, and then it also kind of deepens whatever potential conflicts there are because it makes right. you a principal mm -hmm. and uh, as opposed to an aider and better. And the, there are also, I think, is this concern that, and I don't think it's, I don't think, I mean, I think it's a little tricky for us to assume that every such transaction is right. designed and with this a is concealment what Richard brought motive, up too. right? Or even has race. the effect of concealment. It might not. But, but I think we have to say but we have that to flag if it's being that to done the extent that that's issue. what's going right. on, that that potentially yeah. takes you, you know. Well, and the other, the other one was, I guess, would be Rule <laughs> 1.8.5, holding money as security for a client. And that was the other thing they mentioned is clients will give them you know, more money than would be a deposit for attorney's fees because if the client's money gets seized, then this is like a rainy day fund that the lawyer is going to hold for them so that they'll have some cash after the feds come through and take care and of it. And I, I wove that in, as yeah. you recall, I, wrote, I wove that in as an example of prohibited assistance. Right. Not, or put it the way, assistance that's not covered by 1.2.1. 1. Right, and again, that's under the, the whole concealment. Again, that right. feels like the concealment piece. So, yeah, you know, I, I wondered about that one. I, the uh, rainy day fund thing can be appropriate. Let's, if, if wasn't, this wasn't about a marijuana business and you had a rainy day fund hypothetical, you wouldn't be this sensitive about it. And I, I, don't, I just don't know the law about, that's why I don't practice criminal law. Yeah. Client comes in. I'm doing something. Here's a huge uh, retainer. Well, you're happy to have it. The, right. the, the client may need your your complete attention for months to come. So that's fair. They, they can call that a rainy day fund for a lawyer. Uh, and, and I didn't think this was clear enough 
I, to, that that may well be right. Yeah, and I just don't know the law about you know, this this whole discussion about things that aren't illegal until they're illegal. You know, the offshore accounts. Right. Um, Which is why we have to be clear that once yeah, done, there's nothing per se. Il- yeah, that's exactly right. We don't want to tell people you shouldn't do these things merely because they're associated with a marijuana business. Right. Because of the concealment problem. Because someday these things will be. This business will be far more legitimatized and may not even be a federal crime. Probably won't be right. if we wait long enough. Some point. Um, so if we write something like that with all these red flags, people might think it's amusing 20 years from now. Hopefully they'll think it's amusing within two or three years from now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, while. well, let's just, yeah. you, you, you never know. But I'm, uh, other comments now or you, you have... I, I really like this. This is really, I didn't know anything about this law. And I'm, I'm on the subcommittee, though, I guess. Um, yeah, we're, we're so I did read it with subcommittee. Right, too. right. I used, okay. my, I used extra brain cells to We've read this one. So I, the comment about competence is really important. There ought to be something in there about that. It's really a great comment. Again, the law is changing fast. And really, anyone who decides to represent clients in this area, they should know federal law, state law tax law, criminal law, or understand that they need to refer it out and to get, get, to get that assistance. And I didn't think, right. so I think you should add that. Um, just some nits. I do think the rainy day fund thing ought to be more clear, ought to be set up to make it very clear, un, unambiguous, the clients. This is not for, for present or even future intended legal services. They're just dumping money on you. Right. Then there's a bright line and and that you can make your point well. Um, let's see, I've been typos, but someday they'll all be fixed. Um, I, I think just stylistically, there were, uh, a lot of transitional sentences and paragraphs that I, you might consider uh, streamlining or getting rid of. I just something, I know whenever you write something, particularly when I write, I think, well, that's so good. Think that's, of it as a first draft. that's, that's, well, that's not it. transitional. No, no, that's really that, great. Whatever. Send that, send that stuff. Yeah, right. that right. stuff we'll send to you later. If okay. You, you just, if you've got, if you've got that kind of thought, just, just uh, okay. put yellow right. highlighting on it and send it ahead. I love that stuff. Right. You're yeah. Really I, I had writing. a couple of paragraphs that I thought were no, you're, you're, you're lovely writer. writing, but they were so transitional that you start going, okay, I, I want to get to something. I, I want to. Yeah. Cool. Um, let's see. I thought that you know, this discussion at page six is great. Um, it starts at the top of page six. I was learning something new, but I want to, I had trouble understanding, or is it, it seemed really dense and abstract to me. Um, remind me as I was reading, like the, I remember I had a political science professor who wrote his own textbook and I couldn't understand it. Mm-hmm. Um, and the only, this is great, but the, I just thought you should consider, what word should I use? Dummy down so that people like me will understand it. Page six. Uh, lines 204. I have question marks all over it. 204 to 215. Yeah. Yeah. I, and then the reference to what the Supreme Court considered and rejected, I thought you were giving life to something that we don't want to give life to. Let's just let it go. Uh, let's not call it out as a possible argument that someone could make, because I think the redrafted rules are full of such examples. And I, I don't, but I, I just, I, I don't fully understand um, the point that's being made in 204 through 215. I'm not asking you to explain it now. Well, I think it's worth. I think it's valuable to discuss it. Yeah. Um, let me just say what what I was aiming for, and then you can tell me whether what I had in mind is that that one of the other things that these lawyers said to us, they said, 
Um, we are really uncomfortable with what the Supreme Court did. We're what, sir? Really uncomfortable with what the Supreme Court did. We felt that the version of the rule that went to the Supreme Court gave us more protection than, um, than uh, the version that came back. It left us exposed in certain ways. And uh, that's what prompted the, I, that, this, I, that thought hadn't even occurred to me before. Right? I should have, but it hadn't in, in terms of drafting. But once it was raised, I thought, if that's a vulnerability that they worry about, right, and we're trying to give them ethics guidance, then maybe part of the guidance should be that that vulnerability isn't, uh, isn't as severe as they think, right, that the rule gives them more protection than they think. Uh, that's the idea. Yeah. I, I just think the stricken, the, the language that's rejected by the Supreme Court, and I've, I've stared at it, and I thought, well, it, so you could have assisted as a lawyer, this is, this is the rejected view, in conduct that's permitted by California law. I, 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 don't, I don't know why they're lamenting the loss of that language, because clearly you can function as a lawyer and can explain, you can do this under California law, but you following things, but you can't do this under, it's the uh, assisting, under federal law. It's the assisting language. Yeah, it's, they chopped the assisting language, and that was the thing that they were concerned about, was that the, that the way that the, uh, that's, I mean, I think this is a good topic for us all to think about, right, as to whether we think, because I think you're, there, I thought about the alternative approach once they raised it, which is why, why highlight this problem, yeah, I, right? Why not just say, right? But then it seemed to me, if they see it as a problem, I then we should help them with it. Are, are people, I just thought it was wordsmithing. I didn't think it demonstrated any particular intent on behalf of the Supreme Court to provide less uh, protection. Yeah, I disagree. I think it's a huge change. Okay, I, then, I, then, I, then, then I assume you're right, but I, I'm only, I'm only illustrating that I don't fully understand lines 20 through 204 through, two, through 215. I think you're going to lose some readers, those with my IQ or lower. <laughs> um, so before we leave that point, I, I think the concern, I don't think the assist language, the, the rule retains assist. Yeah. The problem is uh, the significant change that I always saw from the first draft to the second, I agree with Matt, I'm not sure if this needs to be retained. Assist the client in conduct that the lawyer reasonably believes is permitted by. That got taken out. That's what I'm, that's what I'm talking about. But, that's exactly what we're talking about. Oh, we say this. I thought you guys were well, focused I, on I, this. So, assisting conduct. Well, so reasonably what reasonably believes is permitted, yeah, I, I mean, you can sit there and give advice about it, and you can help them interpret. As long as I reasonably believe, you can't believe. write a contract, a lease for the so to rent the warehouse. Right. Yeah. But now the doing, listen. the assisting in doing. You think the that's things. what the Supreme Court? Made. But that's retained in the rule that was adopted. It no, is. But the no, version that's is. adopted is giving you like a specific no, subset of things you can do instead right. of just saying. Which you can assist in conduct. No, I totally. Mm. Do. I don't see where you get that, Andrew. From the may board. assist the client in drafting or administering or interpreting or complying with California laws, including statutes, drafting regulations, laws, drafting laws, right? Including, We're not talking about that now. Right? No, including, not limited to, right. um, statutes, regulations, order, other state, local provisions, even if the client's actions might violate the conflicting federal tribal law. I, th you, there's nothing in here that says you absolutely. you could not draft a contract. No, show me where it says you could draft a contract in that language. Assist a client. It, we're, obviously, you're not helping them with drafting a statute regulating marijuana, right? That's well, happening. some city attorneys yes. might. Sure. That, that's that why that was retained. None of our, none of our lawyers are I don't, I, But comment six talk, talks about drafting. Right, drafting statutes. Legislation. Not necessarily. Yes, it, yes that's what it says. It says. Or administering. It, or administering laws. Comma. It says, no, it with. says including statutes. It's not meant to be yeah, but read only this. statutes. Assist a client. Take them all. 
by one by one. Assist a client in drafting California laws. So right. great, you've helped legislators. Okay. Administering California laws, great. Interpreting California law. So that's somewhat helpful. You're, that's the advice you can give or help them with complying with California law. Nothing in there says that you can assist them in the conduct that they want to do, which conduct is violates federal law. And that's what's I, nice. I, I, I think drafted the Supreme a contract. Court took that out with malice of forethought. They were <laughs> not going to publish a rule which said that you could assist conduct that is a federal crime. How are all these businesses doing it? I mean, we, yeah, we, have, we have a totally billion dollars. They're doing business. it. Well, that, well, my point is that they left it to us to find a way to help out <laughs> California lawyers, and I'm looking for it. Now, whether it's more helpful to California lawyers, because it's ridiculous, right? It's ridiculous to say you can comply, you can advise them in compliance, but you can't advise them in drafting a commercial contract. That doesn't make any sense. But it, but that's what the rule implies. So, we're trying to do what the California Supreme Court quite understandably didn't have the guts to do, which was to put in California law that it was okay to uh, assist in the violation of, in conduct with the federal crime. I, I would, I would not quite put it that way. I would say that they didn't, the, the Supreme Court didn't want to do it in a clear fashion, but I think they left open exactly what you're doing. Yeah, I can't say, that's what I'm saying. To say explicitly. So we're now going to... I, 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 I just calm at six now that we've... This has helped been helping me. I find it vague. Mm -hmm. I, I, you, are, you, are, you are reading things into it that I don't think everyone's going to read into it. Well, if, or, or are you, what, are you what saying... Do you make, what do you make of the fact that this was well, an issue that these lawyers who practice in the area said is a big concern for them. Well, I would Are say... Are you saying that they're missing I, I, the point? I would say to them, if you're going to practice in there, you better understand legislative history. Uh, but this says, assist a client in drafting, drafting or... Drafting a statute. Or, no, there, there, are, there are a lot of ors there. Yeah, but remember, um, Applying with California laws generally, not California marijuana laws, not California laws of, you know, are in conflict with the federal law. They use that phrase in the sentence above and the sentence below. This sentence, the middle sentence, as we all are saying, is intentionally vague, but I don't read it as limiting as some others are. What do you well, make, in make? my mind, I'll just say that my mind has always been that this is the heart of what we're doing. Right. The absolute heart of what we're doing uh, is to make clear that, in our opinion, you cannot be disciplined for assisting conduct that complies with California law. Well, right, but it and it, it, and the rule does not do that effectively, and so we're going to give some a little more oomph. So I um. Oh, uh, can I just a couple other yeah. things? And I hate, sorry if I'm guilty of learning as I talk, but I am. As I, talk here. Um, I just, uh, these are things that I can tell you later. I'm sorry. Great. I, I'd love, I'd love whatever, you know, I'm, I'm welcome. Extended written comments would be great. I'd love them. Um, so uh, maybe if there's other people who had who had ideas or reactions specifically to this part that we've fo been focused on right now, um, which is the kind of section A, the, the, the discussion of how how you read 1.2.1 and comment six and and um, and and um, uh, thread that needle to whether or not. Um, you can assist a client in, for example, writing a lease for a warehouse, if people want to chime in on that. I'm not sure it's the same thing, but you're asking for other people's comments on this stuff we were just... Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah. I have a question about something above it, so maybe I should wait. Is it about 1.2.1? Yeah. Then go. Totally uh, okay. okay. So, I'm just... The, the beat... Yeah. Well, no. Um, it's about the rule. Um, 
the B2, you know, to, to counsel or assist to make a good faith effort to determine the validity, scope, meaning, or application of a law, rule, rule, or ruling of a tribunal. What, where is that in the, I mean, how does that fit in to our analysis? I guess I'm just trying to understand that. Because we have this conclusion sort of at 193, read together, Rule 1.2.1 and Comment 6 permit a lawyer to counsel a client to engage in conduct permitted by California state and local marijuana laws, provided that the lawyer believes the client is engaged in a good faith effort to determine, and then we quote that, the validity, scope, meaning, or application, even if the client's proposed conduct would be criminal under, under federal law. So are we saying, I mean, what does that language mean and how does it fit to the actions that we're analyzing? Are we saying that the types of things we're talking about would be a good faith effort to determine the validity, scope, meaning, or application of the laws? I was trying to, under I read that and then I just felt like it was hanging sort of. And I, now, thought I think it's a really good question. I put it in there as because there sort of seemed to be two parts of B. Yeah. Right? Right. One is you can outline the consequences of any course of action. That's what allows you to advise about federal law, even <laughs> though you know it's a federal crime. You can say, it's a federal crime. If they, they you know, if, if they come after you, you can do 50 years, what have you. Right, you know, right. That's, so it just seemed to me that the other, this was the other part of the rule. I know, and I, I, but I, I struggle with what and, I find myself and, asking. But, what's it, but I agree with you. It doesn't quite capture what we're what we're trying to capture because it feels more like somebody who's actually you know sort of engaged in civil disobedience. That's I, mean, I have that. always thought that language got picked up from somewhere else, and that's always the way I viewed it. I sort of thought that was a well, maybe it's a crime, but if you if you're telling the client to go ahead and break the law because it's an effort to challenge the law, that that's okay. Um, right. And I just didn't know if we were trying to say it may be that we want to pull that language, pull that language at that point in the analysis and, and not rely on it yeah. and yeah. use a different formulation. I'm not sure what the different formulation should be, but I hear you that that might not be the right formulation. Yeah. Just yeah. a thought. I had the exact same reaction. That's the part where I completely snagged. Mm -hmm. um, and I so first of all, I don't think I didn't understand why we would be saying that. Um, we 12.1, and comment six don't have any relevance to um, well, sorry, I shouldn't say that. I, I was um, I think so. I think maybe what Drew's point is the right point, which is that B is really not relevant at all. And really, the, the the tension here is between A and the comment. And B, but the comment is the comment isn't supposed to be an instantiation of B. That's what's weird, right? Hmm. Okay, <laughs> it, I hadn't noticed that. It is, that's weird. It is. It, it says it's it is expressly stated to be oh. an instantiation of B. Well, that's weird. That is. I I think <laughs> that's really weird. Um, okay. Um, I, I agree that you guys are you're on to one of the really important sort of um, questions of how to anchor this. Uh, that I'm not that I don't have a, I'm, this is I'm not at all sure that this uh, the approach taken here is right. But it is it is it is in a way trying to be textual because right. it's actually saying it is B. Maybe we just don't say more about what B says because. It just gets in the way in a funny way. So we just say, without putting that language in, right? Yeah, I think it just makes it a cause detention to something that just doesn't work in the way they've structured this comment. Uh, right. So I, I, you made me laugh when you said that 1.2.1 and comment 6 provide clear textual guidance. There's <laughs> nothing <laughs> clear at all. That's right. Uh, I, that's overstated, isn't it? <laughs> see, I, can I ask you this question? If I after I read this and I ask you the question I have now. So I want to practice marijuana law. The client wants me to begin by drafting a partnership agreement for its marijuana business that involves where we review their new space lease. 
can I do that after reading this article? Help them with a lease, help them draft a partnership agreement. That does, goal does, is to does, say yes. Does this article say I can? Yes. Yes. Okay. Just just <laughs> Jesse do it. It's not that. No, That's where you want to end up. It's, it's the first draft. I know. I'm just. The goal is to say that. <laughs> the goal is to say that, uh, and uh, and um, the the argument I think essentially is plays off of a comment, right? It doesn't really play off the text of B, right? Right. That's right. It plays off of it plays off the comment, and what it tries to argue is, um, and it it's not a very it's not very well done right now. But what it's, it wants to argue, and it wants to get stronger in arguing, okay, come on. It's, first of all, complying and interpreting is well, going to be all over even the simplest situation here, right? And well, it's that's gonna, a very strong point. That seems to me it's going to be, and, and the Nichols versus Keller point that sort mm, of says e compliance and compliance is going to be, and, and interpreting is going to be, if it isn't, Inherit in every situation, it's going to be just over the fence in a way which uh, which requires oh, that. No, and that would be one. And, and then I think there are going to be some more arguments based on the structure of the statute as I come to understand it. Well, it, it, it's be beyond ironic that we have laws that allow major in, industries and yet ethical rules that preclude lawyers from helping anybody in, in, in major California industries that are legal under California law. Well, I think, think that's, that. yeah, I think that's a very, I, I, I think that's a very important point. And you have the legislature also relaxed, the, made an exception to the crime fraud rule in, in, in the evidence code. So yeah. how, how could they give the citizens all this leeway and yet say you cannot get legal advice from any, from any California lawyer? I think it's a, that, I, that point is, put, is in there, but it's not stated as strongly as it could be. That well, right on. You do a great recitation on the beginning and where we are now in terms of current state law, with respect to medicinal and recreational use of marijuana. Something along Matt's lines, right around the, the bottom there, as you transition to the analysis of the ethics, I think would be powerful. Well, I think it's part of the. I think it's part of the argument. It's, it's yeah. the non. I think you start. You try to do it out of the rule, right? And then that. But then we you say. Can't. And if you. And then if you say. And any other reading of the rule would be crazy because. Well, I think you were. <laughs> right. Yeah. right. That's we give up. We can't really read the I would the say rules. it's stupid to read the rule. I, I'd use the word stupid. But that maybe footnote two, I was trying to understand. Footnote two is, again, you know, lovely writing. And, uh, you know, I, I would write the dumbbell version of that. And that's, yeah, I was wondering what you were, what footnote two was striving for. And I, that's. Uh, I was, I'm not quite sure what I was striving for. <laughs> I was trying to leave it in the draft right. because I think those points are relevant, but I haven't figured out exactly how they're relevant. Right. Well, I think what you're doing there. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, I think Matt's comment about the evidence code in conjunction with 1.2.1 .1 would be a good discussion as to say, here are the changes that have been made and under the totality of these circumstances. That's where we come to our conclusion. Put those so in other words, we could say we want we're not making right. we want to read the 1.2.1 uh, as being consistent with what the legislature has done right. here, right? And, har and as harmonizing so that in a sense what the legislature has done reinforces the notion that California public policy Right. requires this broad reading of 1.2.1, which right. uh, we can't quite sustain from the text. Right. And, and the only other comment, Amy, if I can, yeah, yeah, you, of course. is your limitation section on page 8. Yeah. I think maybe we should move that to the beginning. It just seems kind of odd, stuck there in the middle. So either the beginning or the end or something, I don't know. Yeah, I kind of thought I, yeah. I, I, I yeah. like I thought the credits were rolling at that right. point. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, I, I I wondered about whether to put it at the end. I and I put it in there just sort of as a, to remind us that it's yeah. That we I won't think say it's good. Things. I well, just think we need to move. We it. remember you saying, Stephen, we don't need conclusions. Why do we need a conclusion? Do, do 
you remember saying that one time? <laughs> don't let yourself get cross-examined here. What do you mean? <laughs> <laughs> You're harassing I my witness. I feel like, I feel like that did you North did you Carolina that? would be congressman yet. I don't remember <laughs> saying that. <laughs> no. You got me is the correct response, right? <laughs> Go ahead. I'm, that's it. That's the last comment. Um, no, I don't want to. I, I, I was going to respond. I want to hear them. more uh, uh, yeah, if there's gonna, more time. Yeah, no, there is. Go I was going to respond to Matt's point about footnote two, but it's not that important. I want. Are there other people who want to weigh in on this? How how the sort of one point two and comment six and that whole discussion. This has been incredibly helpful, by the way. I mean, this is really really good stuff. Everything has been. Just it's going to make it so much. Next draft is going to be so much better um, because of this. Especially you. Do you, you. <laughs> oh. Two other comments? Or do you, I'm sorry. Well, wait, no. Me? Okay. Oh, oh no, I think Drew's still on uh, that topic, and I, I take it. I'm just going to throw something out there. I, I I don't have a solution for it, but you know this business about. You know, you said we're the key thing. Sort of is. The, I mean the. Giving them advice about the ramifications is sort of the easy part. The hard part you describe better than I'm describing. But it's, you know, can you do the contract and right. stuff like that? And I don't know, maybe this doesn't take us anywhere. I, um, but I wonder if there's some way, or I guess I'll just pose the question. Maybe the answer is no, because it's, it's too intertwined. You, you can't ignore what the underlying business is, but I guess my thought is, is, is there some way to distance acts or cabin acts that are not otherwise illegal or improper? That It's only this kind of tangential relationship to what someone might do downstream. I mean, you know, putting a contract together, as long as it doesn't have provisions in it that are illegal or something like that, would normally be permissible and wouldn't be an issue. So the issue is the contract's, I guess, going to help facilitate this person renting a warehouse or something. And it happens to be that their business, their conduct, what they're going to do when they get there and operate the facility may have implications about whether it's legal or, legal or illegal. And again, I don't know, but I'm just wondering on these sort of the basic nuts and bolts stuff that in any other realm would not be an issue at all. You know, they're just typical things you do mm -hmm. for any business. Is there some way, you know, I don't know, how is that advising the violation of law? Well, it's not, but it's assisting yeah. in conduct. That's the problem. I mean, I, and, and, and maybe you can't divorce it, but I don't know. It's just a thought that I've continually kind of struggled with. I don't have a good answer I, for I it. Think but the, I think that, you know, I think it's a really, it's worth our drilling down on it, and I want to think more about it. My instinct is, and this is maybe just, uh, is that, you know, if somebody wants to sell, let's say, if they're set, I mean, marijuana is, as, as Kendra has pointed out, you know, marijuana is treated as legally equivalent to heroin or fentanyl or, you know, any, actually it's probably worse than fentanyl because fentanyl has some legitimate recognized medical uses, right? But, but I mean, um, the reality is that, as federal law is written, right, you'd have to say what if you're writing somebody a contract to sell a Schedule One substance? How is that not assisting in the sale of the substance? Well, well, well to sell it, but what about what, a warehouse? Do you think you could negotiate a lease for someone to set up where they were going to set up a meth lab if you knew that that's what they were doing? Well, I guess I mean it's the knowledge thing, right? I mean that's the killer. Because yeah, but if I knew someone was a shady character, but I didn't really know what they were going to do with the warehouse, and I didn't have reason to believe that, you know, the, yes, giving me shady. money that's, you know, product of crime or something, and they say, my task for you is to go rent this warehouse. And I'm like, wow, I wonder what the guy's going to do with the warehouse. But, you know, but I, they, I, I, as I said, I think it's worth continuing to drill down into, but my instinct tells me that the law doesn't make that doesn't make that distinction in other areas. Well, and I've thought about it a couple times, and I have no good, <laughs> like I said. But. Yeah, but I want to, it's worth thinking about. One thing on the heels of that that these lawyers brought up to us as well is, and, and again, this is just to throw out to the group to see if it's something we should include or not, is they were asking us whether they had an obligation in a situation, let's say, where they're renting you know, real estate. 
does this lawyer have an obligation to tell the landlords or the landlord's attorney about the risks involved? Um, and I mean, I think in, in other situations, what we would say might be a little different than in this particular situation. So whether that's something we want to include or a point we want to make, um, it's certainly something that that community wants to know. Um, and I have one other point before you, sorry, Richard, I forgot about The other thing they brought up that I have in my notes is the representation of corporate entities, Rule 1.13, um, and that is something that comes up with them a lot. I mean, I think that's a pretty basic point, so I don't know if it's something we need to bring up in this context. That's a property issue. Just that they, they're representing organizations, but right. they often are asked to opine on, you know, what the individual players uh, uh, criminal need. Or potential. Exposure. Criminal liability and exposure, which right. I think, you know, the analysis is the same as it would be in any situation, and whether that's something we feel we need to include in this opinion. I think it's a great idea. Um, but that's something they brought up and, and, and asked us well, about as well. That, that, that there's going to be a situation, that it's going to come up more often in this context than a normal corporation that um, that, they, uh, individuals that the individuals are going to want advice about their individual liability, but you represent the corporation, so you have to do the dance you have to do um, to figure out if you're representing them, if you are, how's that working, if you're not, right. and tell them. and if there's them. a conflict, withdrawing. I mean, it is my true instinct, that this could, my could become a is I don't think we want to do an opinion on that subject, but it's certainly appropriate to flag it as an issue and refer people right. to other opinions on that subject. Yeah. I, I don't think we want to try to work that one through in detail. No, I don't think. I mean, I don't think it requires all that much. It's, no, but it's, it's something that those attorneys brought up to yeah. us as yeah. an yeah. issue that they deal with a lot. Yeah. So, yeah. okay. Now I'm really finished. Okay, <laughs> Robert. Uh, two comments on the banking. I don't know if the only consequence is that money is seized. Uh, that, of course, you're going to advise them of the risks. That's clearly part of the counseling. But if these would be the bank, if the only issue with respect to the bank is that the account's going to be closed, then I don't, I don't know what the ethical, other than advising them of the risks, again, uh, I don't know if that's worth a lot of time. Um, you know, I'm not, I don't know what the laws are and, and what exposure the banks um, would have in that situation if the federal government became involved or, or what, um, you know, what the attorneys could separately be charged with in that situation. I just, I'm not familiar know. with it. But. I just don't know what the ethical obligations, I, I guess I'm, I'm suggesting we stay away from ethical obligations to third parties. Is there an ethical obligation to tell the bank that this is what your clients are doing? Well, I think, I just think that opens up. A, I think one of the points is under the federal laws, you cannot conceal the money gained from cannabis you know, organizations. How are you concealing it if you deposit it in the bank? Well, I guess the argument is if you didn't tell them that that's where the, the source was, that you're concealing it by omitting that fact. And I guess these attorneys have determined that they'd rather err on the side of caution than have that be the issue. Well, I'm, I'm not quarreling with that. I'm just wondering about what the ethical angle is. You yeah. Know? I just don't see it as an ethical I, 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 in terms I, I of what the lawyers have. This is part of what we were talking about. Right. Earlier. This is yeah. the struggle. It's not, it's not clear exactly if these if these people who were saying to us, we want to be transparent with everybody, the rationale for being transparent needs to be worked out uh, for but each that, different but that could thing. be a risk issue. What kind of risk am I willing as a lawyer to take on? Right. And it's I won't ethical. do it unless I can be transparent. Because that, I don't want later be accused of being. So well, Andrew brought up Rule 4.1, which I haven't really explored, but right. I think that's something worth looking into to see if we can. Point, I think we need to deal with it. The truthfulness to it, others. We have to read it. We have to read 4.1 in, in uh, how should I put it? That I mean, the Latin term is in power and materia. We have to read it as part of the same universe as Rule 1.2.1. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. That's a good point. So that, that's where it could come in. Yeah. 
The other point was on the last paragraph of the opinion on page 10, where you're talking about taking a stake, the equity stake. I think um, the approach ought to be, because it's common for people starting out in a business, according to the anecdotal evidence I've gotten from possible speakers on the panel Eric and I are doing on the marijuana, you know, the context of federal state law for the symposium. I talked to several lawyers involved with this in terms of what they could add. And apparently it's quite common, according to the reports I got from two people that um, marijuana entrepreneurs, they're not cash rich. They come in with ideas. They have a seed. They have a plot of land. They, and so they offer a lawyer a stake in the business, not to hide money, not to not to not to launder money, but just because they don't have the cash to pay the attorney's fee. So they offer five percent, ten percent, whatever. And lawyers are faced with the conflict problem, the one point eight or whatever. So they acknowledge that there's a conflict issue, which of course is going to be dealt with. But I think the approach ought to be that it's it, it should be okay, just like it's okay in any other uh, startup company uh, arena. However, it has to be heavily conditioned. It can't be used, of course, though, to um, hide the money, obviously. There have to be disclosures. There have to be, that's the important concern. Now, this seems to put the thumb on the scales and say, you can't really do it. And I'm, I'm bothered by that. I, I, want these businesses to thrive, well, this is one of the ways startup businesses thrive. Uh, they pay no <coughs>
Just from what we talked about today, quickly, I have a couple ideas based on what Kendra was saying. Uh, I wonder if you could work in the full disclosure regarding trust accounts. I, I assume if you're going to banks that know that you're parking marijuana money in there, they're going to be more proactive in protecting that money. So maybe that's a um, protection of the client, like making sure the government doesn't seize it. Maybe if you go to a credit union, it's fine having that money in there. They're going to take more active steps to stop a seizure um, if, if we want to work that transparency in. And then about offshore accounts, um, I thought I saw in the news recently that some giant Canadian marijuana company <coughs> bought up like the biggest California one or something like that. And I'm wondering if, could, can you deal with Canadian companies? Would it have to be incorporated here? Because um, I'm surprised to hear that all these guys wouldn't use Bitcoin or, um, or, or I mean, offshore, depending on where you see it. Um, but I'm wondering if that would apply, because Canada now is basically like California, but legal throughout the country. So just a couple thoughts. I have no solutions or answers to it, but if we're looking into it anyway. So we have um, a red line of um, departing lawyer um, with the whatever changes um, people gave to Dina over the break. So I'm going to suggest we take a 10-minute break, which is for the purpose of stretching, et cetera, and also flipping through that. Um, then we'll take that up when we come back from the break. Um, and then we'll do, I think, the uh, impaired partner. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we'll come back at three.
All right, so we are back, and we are going to um, uh, return to 13003 um, obligations of a departing lawyer, or when a lawyer is departing a firm. Uh, and so uh, over lunch, Dina did a red line with a bunch of changes. And um, so if anyone uh, has anything they want to share about that red line, now's your chance. Eric. A couple of um, some of which are semantic. Uh, in the digest, that line uh, 25, no, just since it's a formal writing, I would suggest may instead of can. And regarding instead of in, line 25 representation so that the client may make an informed choice regarding the counsel. What was the second one? Regarding instead of in. Uh, uh, then at 130. Shows should be choose. And then um, at the, I guess it's the last sentence of footnote two on page three, where it's written. Under those circumstances, to prohibit departing lawyer from communicating with the client about the departure or demanding that such communication be unreasonably delayed would generally be improper. It's the last clause that troubles me. We talk on the next page at uh, generally 128 through 142 about this issue. Uh, I'm just wondering if given how that last clause of the last sentence on in footnote two reads, whether we really need it, given the discussion elsewhere, it kind of leaves the reader hanging at footnote two. So you, Eric, are you just suggesting we take that last sentence out? Well, I'm, I'm looking at it a little more carefully now. Um, I, I, yes, but I'm trying to decide if perhaps the sentence before that begins, the attorney who originated the matter. I don't know that either of those is necessary. It's already a long footnote. Mm -hmm. And we cover this elsewhere. You know, it, it's a footnote, but we're offering right. seemingly gratuitous explanation and explication. What would you? Uh, I might be in favor of having the footnote only be the first sentence. Yeah, I think that's fine. What do you think, Dina? I don't think we say it elsewhere. Which 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 aspect? All of it. The part where you talked about the um, client doesn't belong to a particular attorney. I did read that elsewhere. Yeah, we definitely say that. I can't. Yeah, we're talking about in the context of the client origination thing, which, come, which comes up all the time in departure matters, where you have firms saying. Well, let me see. You can give notice to the clients that you originated, and we have to talk to the other partner about who originated, and they view these things in terms of like client origination based on these compensation structures. So I think it's a really important point to make. Um, and we took some language related to it out. I mean, I'm open to additional edits. I don't think this has been stated in this way elsewhere in the opinion, though. Well, starting with the very last sentence, I tend to think Eric's onto something that like we do this, if we're going to go this far 
to start opining on, you know, ha on certain conduct. It feels like it should be in the body rather than a footnote. We started out just by saying, hey, you know, we're not, this is not to say that law firm compensation structures are bad, whatever, it just creates these problems. And so flagging the problem seems one thing to me, kind of analyzing it and giving a prescription in the well, context. refer to the other discussion. We have that paragraph that, Tina, that you read. Um, uh, you read to um, Matt earlier um, that basically says you can't stop people from communicating, right? Why don't we just cross-reference to that? Yeah, I mean, it is specific to origination credit. I just thought that it was anecdotally, I think it's helpful within this context here. I mean, I, with, in terms of the last sentence, um, I mean, I know that that concept is saying you can't, you shouldn't prohibit an attorney from talking to a client, you know, a departing attorney, but in terms of this context, um, Well, other people can chime in on. It just seems like a lot. Um, I mean, I, I mean, we it. We've, we've set out the parameters of like, you know, what are the ethical responsibilities? And no lawyer can be prevented from talking to any client who might, you know, reasonably want be, want to go with the lawyer and, you know, the, the client's interest has to come first and you, um, you have to, from, you know, all, we've all set out all those principles that are, you know, this is just a more kind of specific application. Um, and uh, I think the, the the impetus for the footnote is just to to is important, which is to say, you know, the fact that we're saying that the compensation structures lead to certain mindset is not to say that the compensation structures are ethically problematic, just that they lead to this. But then we sort of go on to sort of go back to opining about you know how things should be handled. It feels like I, I just it's feel like we've set. I think that's what the intended purpose is to give an example of this context and the way this has happened. But what, I know, but we start out by saying we're not cr we're not mind. criticizing. Like if, our first point is, hey, we're not criticizing this compensation structure. But and then we go on to a long thing after that about you know what can happen. But our initial point was just it's not. This isn't a criticism of compensation structures. Just um, just they contribute to this particular belief. Right. So this is an example of that. Um, I, I think. But we already said that, said that above, right? That's exactly what we're saying above. That's what what, it, what caused the need for the footnote in the first place, is we were saying that these, you know, that, that, that these conflicts arise because lawyers think of themselves as owning clients. Do Justin? We do we discuss the concept of the property concept in this terminology of origination credit in the body? If not, I th uh, we'll find out in a second. Or just once, okay. So, I, I, you know, I, I, I take. Let's wiggle back to the Got it, and then it goes to the footnote. So, in that sense, I think that the footnote supports then the, the body. But you know, to the extent we're thinking this is maybe too much for a footnote, why not state the the initial point that we're not taking a position on compensation structures, but I think provide the benefit to the reader um, that you know we don't we 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 could take out the part about. Um, how, about, how about this? That's okay. I mean, my, my point is, let's just, why, don't, why not just say the, the first sentence and then give the example 
uh, about origination credit, I think what we're trying to say in that example, the gist of it, is that <clears throat> origination, the originating partner's um, relationship to the client can't be used to, um, <clears throat> you know, impair communications that need to be had with the client or um, impair the representation when there's a, a departure situation. I think that's a, a helpful example to give um, in, in kind of real world. Right, and I wanted to capture that in the last sentence that you didn't hit on, because you said, um, um, so we were simply saying about the departure. I mean, because that's the key example I think yeah. we're trying so to that's get. That's the point I mean, that needs to be made. Point, yeah. really, is origination is completely irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, right. Uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of the ethical uh, Right. And then it's a two-sentence footnote. <laughs> then it'll be a two-sentence footnote. So that cuts it significantly. Yeah. I don't think there needs to be a comma after matter. I feel like I don't know enough about this area to make as strong a statement as this. I mean, it sounds right to me, but then Steve said, just throw it out there and see what we get back, which I'm fine with. The CFC of the Association of Business Originating Attorneys. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, as we discuss elsewhere, that's not the standard for communicating with clients, whether you originated the work. There's many attorneys and firms that originated work, and then they're off like golfing three days a week or something somewhere, right? And they're not managing the day-to-day, -day, and so like that's kind of the point. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you
The Association of Originating Attorneys. Yeah, if they're not playing golf. <laughs> Line 278, um, it says, however, if one lawyer fails to notify a client or refuses to do so, the other one must. It sounds like you're talking about lawyer and lawyer, um, but the preceding line is that it, it is not imperative <clears throat> that both departing lawyer and the law firm notify the client of an impending departure. So it seems to me to make it appropriate it, would better read. However, if one fails to notify a client or refuses to do so, the other one must just delete lawyer. It would be the easiest way to fix it. I, I had a, a just like two comments too. I don't know if you were done, Eric, though, because you were. Um. So as a general thing that I wanted to throw out um, is that I had, uh, in terms of a change that we didn't discuss, was that I added this footnote on, on footnote seven, um, I added that last sentence there um, related to this, the concept of ability and willingness. Um, which is throughout and is in other ethics opinions too, just to kind of clarify that that point. But I did also want to point out that on lines 251 to 258, that that exact concept is discussed there. And so I wanted people to, I want to know what people think about whether it's also helpful to have that footnote in there just to remind, like you're not saying, oh, hey, guess what? I'm not going to represent you in my notice letter. And then that's the end of your obligation um, or whether they, you think it's sufficient to have to not put it in there because it's included elsewhere in the opinion. Um, and then Mimi, I just had two little, um, on, on line 176, I think we left in that footnote four, but there's not actually a footnote four, but the, the four is there. So, um, so then it kind of makes it so that we go to from footnote. Oh, I know, but when you clean it up, it'll automatically. It'll get rid of it. Because now there's no footnote four, but it'll change all those and make the one below footnote, okay. Because I can't tell if that's still in there or not. Okay. And then in that same sentence, um, the language that was added, and any client departing lawyer reasonably believes may wish to transfer its files, I think, um, instead of its client's files. I mean, that's confusing because you're talking about the client. Well, I guess it's client's files, sorry. <laughs> it's just, it was read a little clunky for me, so I'm trying to understand what I'm talking about. Yes. Is that right to take out clients or should it be fine? Oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I actually had that one too, thank you. Um, and then there's one more little typo thing, which is like a double period. Where is that, Matt? Line, one, line 106. Yeah, at the end of line 106, where we were just, there's like a period before and after the footnote. And don't we, because we need to cite them. Well, we already talked about how they're applying it. But it's a quote from But don't we need to jump cite? Here. Is it the same site? Yeah, the same Heller or whatever. Right. Uh, no, I don't know. I get it, but there's no page site. Do you think the 1.16 oh. is too strong? Oh, yeah, thanks. Okay.
client, yeah, client, yeah. There was a question on the, um, Um, yeah, in the, and this footnote three is what I'm looking at and Matt was just pointing out, like I don't, I, there's not a page number for that Heller site. Um, okay. For that quote. I thought I had it somewhere, but I don't see it. Okay. So does anyone else have any opinion about the additional sentence to footnote seven, whether they think it's helpful or don't think it should be included because it's already been stated elsewhere? Or? Yeah. Yeah, well, that's why I was trying to address for him, and he's gone. <laughs> There was a lot of does in there. <laughs> I was like, oh my God. Right, exactly. Does it shave it down by? Never heard that decision. He does. Amy Bonzi? Yes. Stephen Bundy? Yes. Kendra Basner? Yes. David Carr? Yes. Eric Deitz? Yes. Justin Fields? Yes. Matt Hodel? Yes. Oh, yeah. Matt Hodel? Yes. Toby and Linder? Yes. Adam Koss? Yes. Amber Lee? Yes. Dina Roche? Yes. Teresa Schmid? <laughs> Richard Solomon? Yes. Stephen Sparta? Yes. Marshall Whitney. Thank you. I know you're going to have like just the first three, but there was one whiff that was actually on the first three. Please send that to me for uh, any of Thank you. Okay. Great. Um, just about the symposium, we're still putting together the website that will have the um, panel descriptions. Hopefully, it'll be up by the end of next week. But um, just so you know, in the past, we had a e list that had everyone's past people who have attended their email addresses. What we've been told, what we've been told is we can't reuse that list anymore because it doesn't, apparently there's some kind of regulation or something that says that, you know, if you add, get added to or subscribe to an e-list, you have to be given the opportunity to opt out every so often. And so that list is really, really old. So we're basically not going to be sending out an email blast to the same people we did last year. What we will do, though, is put it up on the State Bar website in that, um, and like I think in the Cal Bar Journal and on the ethics page and all that. We're still going to do the mailing, the physical mailings to the people that we have on the list. But it would be really helpful that once you receive um, an email from Lauren or from staff that you try to um, regarding the symposium, try to do some outreach and marketing for us, you know, within your local bar associations or your firms or anyone that you think would be interested and that'd be really appreciated. So let's, uh, <clears throat> I think we're going
going to, um, so what I want to do is I want us to talk about um, the colleague impairment. Um, and then we're not going to um, do a discussion, a full-fledged discussion of the ancillary business because um, Andrew has some views on it, so I think I'd want him to be present for the conversation. But 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 we did want to talk a little bit with the committee about um, about it, about providing this draft opinion to the um, what is that commission called or the committee task called force. the task force on um, on access through access, access through innovation access. of legal services the ADLs. Um, anyway, so after maybe after the impa uh, colleague impairment, we'll talk about that. And then I also want us to talk about whether we want to provide any kind of comment to the Board of Trustees about this, their proposed shrinking of COPRAC to 10, um, because that would have to be, that will happen, that meeting will happen before our next meeting. So that's the goal. Yes. Okay. Maybe we should, um, hmm. All right. Uh, Let's. St how many people have to leave at four? Okay. <laughs> really? Oh, terrible. All right. Well. All right. So so let's um, let's do this um, really quickly. There, Adels is considering. Um, one of their tasks is to consider whether um, uh, whether five, something like 5.7 should be adopted or other methods to in, assist lawyers in doing ancillary business. And so one of the questions literally that they are, are have a memo on right now is should it be a rule change? Should it be an ethics opinion? Uh, should it be blah? And, and Andrew circulated this, uh, this memo at least to to, the, the to all, oh, and then to everybody? Did he later? Yeah. Or, oh, yes, he did. Clearly. Oh, anyway, so, but the, it's odd because they don't seem to have had the benefit of seeing our, you know, nearly finished opinion. So would, does the committee uh, support, we were just saying, we, there's no reason that we can't provide it to them. Does anyone have any concerns about providing it to them? Or is everyone okay with that? It's all public, yeah. yeah. They just don't know about it. Part of the oddness of this is that um, they have actually done an, they've actually looked at the question of whether you, uh, you could write an opinion <laughs> like ours. And unlike State Bar staff, they concluded that you could <laughs> for pretty much exactly the same reasons that we concluded you could. Uh, so closing the loop might make sense and might also encourage them, if they like the tenor of the opinion, to go the opinion route. And right. we don't throw something out that will be immediately superseded. Yeah. So, so basically, the agenda is posted, and there's still time to add supplemental to the agenda. So uh -huh. I can add that. Great. To the agenda to give an actual agenda item. Um, but my question is, do you guys want to add some kind of cover letter? I think we probably would want to put so something through. Yeah. That. Letter. Yes. Like by, if we can get you that by Monday. Um, it would be very brief, I think. Yeah, just this. The I think the deadline to post additional materials, I think what we gave them in response to the agenda materials, basically, so it would be the same thing, would be Monday, at Monday. The Monday morning at the latest. I think it would be very brief. Like, COPREC wants to make ADL yeah. aware that, you know, of the, yeah. of, of of the draft. Opinion. Here's the most recent public, uh, <coughs> public yeah. version we'll, of it. We'll, yeah, we'll send you an email with the okay. text. Does that work? So, yeah, no, that's fine. I just. I need it by Monday morning because that's when we're posting the rest of the materials, and we don't want it to get like people like, oh, I downloaded all of it, but didn't get that one. I understand. Yeah. So we're not discussing that opinion now. No, we're not because because okay. of Andrew not being here. So we'll 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 push that one over to April, um, with some regret. Okay, I, I want to do the um I want to talk about the size of the committee and did people want to make a comment? So does any I mean, the, the state of play is that initially we were told. COPRAC's going to be reduced to seven. Now it seems like the proposal is that co I think that the staff is making is that it be reduced to seven. Ten. Uh, I'm sorry, 10, um, from seven to 10. It is also the case that 
it's go COPRAC is going to have the additional job of writing these uh, arbitration, um, fee arbitration opinions. And so among those 10 people is going to have to be apparently, I don't know if it's going to still going to be two, but at least someone with competence in that area. Hopefully okay. that we could find, we should be able to find people Dual who can people. do both. So that's probably I mean, not a big thing. There are people who clearly do both. How many members do they have? 16. Does that include uh, the executive committee or? I think it would. Uh, I talked with Andrew a little bit about it this morning. The way okay. it would work uh, is uh, that their terms, the terms of all of these committees, what? The terms of all these committees are going to four years. So um, the idea would be essentially that there would be, I think, an average of two people per class, right? And then you'd have a vice chair and a chair, something like that. Or maybe it would be three people in one class, two people in uh, three other classes. So you have nine people, and then the chair would serve a fifth year. Something along those lines. That's the underlying idea. So only the chair serves five years. Everyone else serves four. And that would imply nine other people, so two, three classes of two and one of three. Now, Andrew has worked it out in a way that's convinced him that one of the classes would have to be one. That seems not very helpful. Uh, but anyway, that's we don't know. But that's, that would be the basic framework they're talking about. And in, in that, you'd have to do, within that framework, uh, there would be no advisor. Uh, and uh, the vice chair would be a member of the fourth year class. Hmm. Right? So not if you had, not necessarily, or a third year, a third or a fourth yeah. year but member of the third or fourth year I think class. it was, if you, I think this is what they're proposing. So let's say um, you were, you are a second year that for next the following year wants because you know right now we allow you the second years to also apply in that case it'd be like a third year but anyways if you ended up being vice chair too early like one year too early you lose a year because then what happens you don't get to serve a fifth year basically if you became vice chair in your third year <coughs> then your fourth year would be chair so in a situation where there is a class of just one right there's always the possibility that you know a second year could also run for vice chair, sacrificing one year of being on the committee, but you know, yeah. not really sacrificing because you would still do four it years, seems, you just wouldn't do five. It seems weird not to have the classes have better balance than that, but it seems like there would have to be a way to work it out eventually. But that's a something, that's a sort of secondary issue. The questions we would get to, I think, have leverage with the, uh, where our arguments, if we want to make them, would have to be of one of two kinds. One, workload. Two, diversity. Those are the arguments that staff is using to argue for 10 versus 7. <clears throat> and the only question, I think, would be whether our, staff, so our, um, our staff, and we have a different view. More diversity, more, or more diversity, more broader range of people, or more <laughs> workload to get it to some higher number. That would be what we'd have to say. So can the answer be tough? No realistic prospect of getting more than ten. No, that means I don't think that there's anyone who knows that that's the absolute top. That's just what staff is proposing. Oh, staff. I wins. think we're not going to win the four well, years, though. We're not going to. You know, that, that's a that fixed piece thing. Feels like we're because gonna, we're not all the other uh, sub entities, subcommittees, whatnot, are limited to seven. Right. So asking for ten is even asking for more. Well, there are. Jenny gets more, right? And there are at least two or three others that have gotten more. I don't know if they still will, though. But we do more work. Are the other committees subject to four-year terms as well? And would that, that was my question, will that apply to people who are presently sitting on the committee? Yeah. I don't think, I think, I don't think everything is prospective. Oh. Yeah, I don't think any other, yeah. I don't think any other committee has a production issue. I mean, <coughs> our production will be substantially impaired if we're limited to even 10. So it just it, it just doesn't make sense to try and squeeze us into this same model that where people are just basically meeting and discussing common business without having a production. 
So, I, I mean, we've got not just the opinions, but we have the CLE articles as well. And um, it just doesn't make sense that the bar, bar is serious about wanting us to generate opinions. It ought to be prepared to have an adequate and the ethics committee and adequate to do that. Unless they're happy with one opinion a year instead of two or three. Yeah. And the ethics symposium and yeah. the new arbitration assignments. Not, and I think we highlight how long these ethics opinions are around yeah. and how we have so much trouble getting them through as is. The free arbitration <coughs> uh, panel or committee, how many are on that panel? I know it's being run slowly. But if the expectation is that <coughs> this committee will assume the responsibility of two standing committees, uh, should there not be consideration of that in terms of the number of members I mean, it's essentially asking this committee to do more with less. That's, that's exactly what they're asking. <laughs> now, that might yeah. seem appealing, but uh, it is a volunteer For a longer period of time. <coughs> well, we have other roles, too, like, you, like with the rules of the process and stuff like that, like with the recruitment and everything. Like with this task force currently, we might assume that they come up with some ideas about reforming the rules and they'll want us to on those issues. I mean, those things are come up, right? That's absolutely right. We, you know, we're every time, I mean, this, this issue with the files, I mean, there's frequently questions that get pushed to COPRAC. And so there would be an argument that <coughs> if, the, um, if the bar wants to ha continue to have the confidence that it can uh, rely on COPRAC to provide that kind of guidance, they're going to um, need to have us be at an adequate size that we have enough members to provide that kind of guidance given, again, everybody's practicing lawyer and or professor or, or what have you. So that's an issue. Is there a concern that pushing back too hard may prompt uh, a sunsetting of this committee? <laughs> I can't tell you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I doubt it. There was a pretty big fight. Right. The battle to be recognized as an ongoing needed entity or, or committee. So I don't see them saying, well, we're not we're gone. <laughs> we, might, we might lose the battle to get more people in. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really well, I, I think we can easily make a pitch for keeping it at 16. And I think, though, we should lean perhaps more heavily on the diversity argument than on the workload argument. Yeah, just because my sense of this discussion is the, the board's perfectly happy to take less production in, in service of their goal, which is to save pennies. Um, but I think in terms of the diversity argument, I think we can make a good argument that the committee to, for even with reduced workload, for that workload to have relevance, significance, that it needs to be the product of a diverse group of people. Uh, I don't think, assuming the arbitration advisories, when you look at the number of advisories over the years, it's certainly a lot fewer than the ethics opinions. And, and mostly what it appears that MFAA has done recently is go back and revise old arbitration advisories to bring them up to date. Uh, I don't get a sense that there's a lot of ongoing current production <coughs> needs on that end. So I don't think that's going, I, I, that'll, that's some additional workload, but it doesn't strike me as being a tremendous amount of workload. But I mean, typically you're going to want to ask for what you want, and I think what we want <coughs> is 16 members. Symposium. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, would you ask their concern? What what are they? Money. Money. Well, I, I, yeah, I think so. Oh, from the conversation we had with Andrew that was a while back, it's it seemed like it's actually maybe not money as a primary driver. It seemed like there's this kind of notion that um, it's hard to control committees that are of a larger size. They, there's a, they have a consultant that did a sort of analysis for them that suggested actually, um, this is what we were told, seven is the ideal number for any committee. 
<laughs> and the uh, and, and like the ideal fruit of, is banana. The Old Testament, right? <laughs> you know, any, any committee, they don't even know what the committees do all kinds of different things. Wow. So they said that the larger the committee, the more stalemate they get. Like they basically, it's like okay, this this is not going to get voted out because there's too many people on the committee. And but the thing is, if you think about it. Almost all of our opinions, when we vote it out, it's unanimous. Yeah, we don't have so a lot of controversy. Yeah, you know, I mean, and it's good. really well thought out, and a lot of yeah. people give their different and experiences and input, and yeah. so which makes it a great quality right. product. But right. That I think that was it. The larger the group, it's harder to get things done. So you, you can address that. Yes. That, yeah. yeah. Um, just one point, and then Steve, I'll grab to you. Um, I, that goes to David's diversity point. Right. I mean, that the exactly. nature of what we're doing here actually requires that and benefits from that. Right. It's, it's not an obstacle. It's what gets you to the type of product we're trying to do or what we're doing. We need the, a variety of different people weighing in, and it needs to be vetted the way we vet it. Yeah. And it, I think we could point to a, a long history of highly superior work product right. to, to bolster that. Steve did some really good, quick research on the comparable uh, – Committees in other uh, states, um, and the, their their um, committees are huge yeah. compared to us. I was going to say the smallest one um, is, I think, of, of any state of re remotely comparable size, is like twenty nine. Wow. Right. Well, I haven't. I haven't. I never. I because Andrew told me that was a bad fact or useless fact. I haven't. Fake Fake news. I haven't chased down the Texas one yet. I, I would do it. I, I, I I'm happy to I pull think it's that very information together. It, it look it makes it look kind of crazy because we'd be yeah. going on a per capita basis in terms of how big our state bar is. We'd end up with something like one tenth the number of committee members that any other state had, and that to me, you know, that that has some force. Steve? What's the mechanism for presenting this? Are you guys going to appear and um, make a presentation? Or are we going to come up with like a written document to submit? Or so I don't know what the best approach is, but I um, I I was imagining we would write something so that every, the whole group can have seen it and will weigh in on it. Although it's it's not going to we, we're not going to have another meeting, so this is going to have to happen by email, and we'll have to go through staff to do that because we're not allowed to have a meeting or something like that. Um, <laughs> But uh, so, but I will. Um, I have a a colleague who's on the board of trustees, so I can ask. I mean, I think we have the option. Mimi, you can correct me to appear. At, yeah, but I don't know. I, I don't have a sense of what would be more effective. For yeah, we could all go storm it. Chance. <laughs> we carry, carry signs. Exactly. In the old days. Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. We can make signs. I, you know, one, one thought, so our, we should think a little bit more about why six committee and not, say, 12. It, well, or whatever. I was going to say, if we have four, four-year, if we have, mm. how do we get to 16, right? It's one way to think about it. What's the, what's the idea? Is it three members per class in a four-year term? That gets you to 12. A chair would get you to 13. Right. That's true. If the if the yeah if uh, right if you have to if go to add, four add years four more four if you have if you're going to have four members in each class then you're going to need seventeen members. How many opinions are in circulation at a time? Uh, I think it varies. Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, if you look at ours, actually, at one point we had I think probably like thirteen at one time. Like this is recently. Right up until recently, but I mean, back in the past, when I started here at the bar, there was literally only six opinions on an agenda. Right. And they got talked to death at every single meeting. Yeah. So, but maybe that's a way that we would justify 16, is looking at how much, you know, again, it goes to the workload. But they but could always tell us to dial it back, you know, focus just on three opinions at a time. So I don't know how persuasive that would be, you know. Mm. They're like, well, if you focus on these three, you'll get them out quicker. <coughs> Mm. Has there ever been not a, with less people? We won't. <laughs> has there ever been a four-year term applied to this committee no. that you're aware of? Is there a concern just based upon um, workload as to the ability to recruit and retain people for four years? I think a lot of the other committees are also four-year terms, though. 
something like that. Yeah. But just in terms of the expectations of the committee members, um, I mean, I, that's probably not a concern for the bar, per se. Well, I guess you could ask yourselves, would you guys have been deterred if you knew that it was a four-year term as opposed to a three from applying? I and actually we knew that it was all going to be live broadcast. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to be Taking subject to all of that into account? <laughs> Although the good thing about having a four-year term is that possibly when you know you can actually see an opinion that you've helped work on from the beginning come to fruition. I think look, so I, I, have to, I I don't think that's a from my perspective and probably from the perspective of several other people in the room. That's not a. a if I'd been told it was a four-year term, I would have been more eager. <laughs> and uh, and um, it just just because it, the work is really fun. Yeah, maybe the four, I think the four-year term is probably not the one we should battle. Yeah. Sure. So if we concede with that, which maybe they'll steer no, us as to the four -year term is only picking a leadership term, a four-year term on top of that. They're saying during that period of time, you can come up with a new leadership. You, you, oh, no, you can be, you be a chair in your fifth year. Only oh, the okay. chair would okay. get an additional year. You'd be a vice chair in your fourth year. That way it would yeah. I'd keep the classes together one more year, no no sad breakups. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, who wants to, um, yes, Stephen. I did want to suggest that we also emphasize the consumer protection function of this committee. And in light of the amount of work that the committee is now doing, the likelihood is that either the number of articles we publish or the number of cases we process is most likely to go down. I even have concerns about how inadequately currently the state bar makes use of the work products from this committee. I find it very cumbersome to navigate the website. I've discussed this with Andrew already. And I think there's a direct relationship with consumer welfare for all the citizens of the state of California. So I think that's a cogent argument you can make in terms of cutting the numbers of persons in this committee relative to the work it performs. Uh, I apologize that this has been covered, but what is the status or what would be the contemplated status of the public notice? Which it, it'd still be, is one or two? And what if it goes to seven? Then the minimum is still one. So, um, is there someone who wants to um, take the lead on drafting a letter? Um, just getting a getting a draft out there. So we first to take a straw vote or a vote of some kind to support that. Um, just four of each, just to sure. have something on record. I'm, I'm just I'm not uh, sure about what the legality is. Yeah, I'm not sure either. Do we need to? You can take a straw poll. Yeah, okay, sure. Let's take a straw poll. I, I feel like I've had a straw poll based on the comments, but yeah, um, no, but uh, sure. Uh, let's just have everyone. Um, well, let's let's put it this way. Uh, here's the proposal is to write a letter to the um, board of trustees expressing our view that the. Um, that the committee should stay at the current size it is. Um, anyone, is anyone opposed to that? Friendly amendments? Okay. Who's going to write it? I'll volunteer to write it. I'll Thank you, David. Take a crack at a first draft. Yeah, and let's How figure soon, out the timing. When's it due? Yeah. yeah, soon do we need this? When do we need it to get it? To, well, when's the meeting? The 13th and 14th, is that right? Yeah, well, March to be a long letter. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> what did you say? March 14th is the meeting? Two days? 
Tuesdays? I'm sorry, I can't. Friday of next week? Friday of next week. We need a final letter by Friday. So we need a, well, I don't think the letter needs to be, you know, encyclopedic in length. So. No. Agreed. So. <laughs> My goal will be, will be have a first draft by Monday. Great. Um, and, and Mimi, the way we have to do this under Bagley Keene is what? To have communications among the whole committee. We circulate. You circulate it. So David, what you should do is send the draft to staff, and then they'll send it out. Right. And then, um, like, we can't vote on making edits, but you guys can give us the edits, and we can circulate, and we can take comments, but there's no voting involved, because you can't vote when you're not in a meeting. Yeah. Also, before we get to 4 o'clock, maybe yeah. you want to ass let people know which ones will be discussed at the next meeting, yeah. at the very least. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so next meeting. So next meeting is symposium end, Correct. right? And remind me, um, symposium is on the Thursday, Friday, Friday and our meeting's on the Thursday? Thursday, Correct. Okay, great. Um, so we'll definitely want to talk about the marijuana opinion again. Uh, and um, we will definitely talk about um, uh, the ancillary business. Um, we'll hope to write. Okay. Fantastic. So we'll have that. Um, and Marshall would like to get his. Which one's Marshall's? Uh, 17003. Okay. Um, and I will will have a new version of uh, litigation funding, so we'll okay. talk about that. I think that's plenty. Yeah. And we got we got minutes. Matt with the match. Oh yeah, and, and we'll talk. Then. Yeah. Well, we because I don't think the comment period is closed. So oh, we'll it wait. isn't closed. So I thought. No. It was three days. Yeah, yeah, it closes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She said the next meeting is the one before, right before the yeah. symposium. Yes. Correct. So. It is. Um, okay, so that's the plan for um, April. Um, anyone who can stay, um, Eric, are you able to stay? I am. That's good. We'll talk a little bit about uh, impaired colleagues. It's going to be fun. Uh, all right, thanks, everybody. Awesome meeting. Got an opinion out. Yay. Good luck uh, for those of you who are traveling. What's, the, what's with the travel? Why is it so bad? Is my opinion, is my plane going to be? I, I heard that the Southwest schedules were all screwed up. Oh. They're screwed up in the sense that they shifted the time with the morning flights and the afternoon flights, so it's either catch an early flight or catch a really early flight. Oh, really? Okay, well, we're going to have to deal with that because that's going to be a regular thing. Bye, Justin. Bye. Okay. All right. Yes, it, but it will not be this one. It will be, you will have a fresh new draft that you'll get. So don't bother with that old dingy one. Are you having week too? Bye. I don't know. Do we have? Yeah. Ah, cool. We won't be voting. Oh, thanks. Let's, let's vote it all out, guys. Here we I go. I didn't mean it that way. I just meant... <laughs> all right. Uh, I am not going to start with comments, but I just want to say I really like the new... Uh, I, I like the new approach with, the, um, with getting rid of that old senior dude who was confusing to me. And... Um, <laughs> And uh, and with the, for him too. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And um, and with the big firm, little firm. I think those those are all fabulous changes. So do you want to uh, give a spiel? Sure. So, uh, I mean, as Amy's observed, the comments provided. Prior to, the comments provided. Uh, prior to the last draft have been incorporated in terms of refining uh, some of the facts, uh, taking into account more directly the specific responsibilities under 5.1 and 5.2 relevant to uh, managerial or supervisory attorneys. The 
idea being that the size of the firm um, may have some impact as to more practical aspects, but nevertheless, the duties remain largely consistent and are individual such that they can't be, um, you know, there, there's no Nuremberg type defense. <laughs> Uh, I did have some questions that I had written on this red line draft that I'd appreciate public comment about. Um, and one of the things I couldn't help but notice is the, the digest itself is about a page long when viewed on a single page, which strikes me as perhaps a bit <laughs> excessive. Um, there we go. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, I think to the best of my recollection and note taking that all of the recommendations and or suggestions were taken into account and incorporated. Stevens, uh, in particular, were helpful. So with that said, I don't, we did not circulate this among the drafting committee because it was actually produced for the, uh, January meeting, so that happened around the holidays. So the drafting committee has not uh, offered any comments, and I don't know. Well, Matt's still here. And Dina. And Dina, actually. Sorry. Most of your so, most of your committees yes, here. Yes. Subcommittee. I I just noticed that Kendra was gone, so I wasn't taking a broad enough view of things. So uh, with that said, I'd appreciate their input. Yep. Okay. Subcommittee. Um, yeah, overall, I thought there was a lot of good additions. I have a couple comments about the facts, and then I'll go into some of my other comments. So on, on page three, um, at the top of that, you say the partner appears distracted by personal issues, including a pending divorce. I wonder if we should just be less clear about what's going on. I mean, it's, I think that the key, key thing is that this, um, which goes to line like 101, that the attorney is noticed, um, exp expresses to partner um, her concerns, I think about the changes in the attorney's behavior or something like that, that there's this notice, these noticeable changes in the behavior, right? I mean, the person's all of a sudden not showing up to a bunch of things. And um, I think it's important, especially in that second paragraph, to note that, that there's, you know, it's not just expressing concerns about the firm's representation of the client, but this changes in the behavior of this attorney. Um, the other comment about the facts I have is that I kind of like the idea that trial's not 30 days away, but maybe 90 days away. And, and the reason I would suggest that is because I think the 30 days kind of implicate, first of all, it's really close to trial. And it implicates, I think, issues related to discovery closed and like, you know, expert disclosures and things like that. I feel like 90 days there's a little bit, it's close to trial, but there's a little bit more like this isn't just a complete, I mean, 30 days before trial, if you felt like your lead trial attorney was incapacitated, that would be a major emergency, right? So, um, and we may have to address other things related to that. And I think it, maybe if we give it a little bit, you know, it's close to trial, but a little bit further out, like 90 to 120 days, that might be easier to kind of dodge some of those procedural questions about how to navigate that really urgently pending trial. Um, on line 152 at the end of that paragraph, um, the, just the, the comment about the impaired lawyer, I wondered if you wanted to just to do a citation to 1.116A2 there, um, related to that rule. Um, a2, at the end of line 153, just that an impaired lawyer who cannot continue to represent clients competently owes a duty to cease the representation. I think that's out of that rule. Yeah. So we should mm -hmm. cite to the rule. Okay. Um, uh, okay, I don't understand that comment that I made. So my, my bigger comment about 5.1 and, and I, I like the introduction of that, but I was one. I, I feel like, and I'd be interested in other people's opinions, that we should 
we should talk about, I mean, shouldn't the firm develop policies for handling like an impairment under 5.1 and talking about, I mean, 5.1 directly deals with this idea that you need to ensure that your attorneys can, um, you know, that they're complying with the rules, right? And I'm not necessarily wanting to conclude language of saying that they shall have a wellness policy, but I think the idea being that we need to, um, and maybe we should say that, I don't know, but I mean, the idea that this, this framework of this particular thing, this attorney's trying to navigate this under these facts, it seems like without this idea that there's a wellness policy, like, you know, and that I think we at least need to start getting a lot of firms because this is kind of a recurring issue that's happening in, 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 in law, law, law firms, large and small, about the fact that when you have these situations, like what's the firm's protocol for handling that? Do they have an approach where they say, um, well, we have a career counselor or, you know, a life coach support that we use that we can have mentors that we're going to assign to this person to check in and sort of have policies that are developed, which is what I think one of the very valuable aspects of 5.1 addresses is just like, okay, policies for helping attorneys comply with the rules. So um, attorney wellness is like a big thing right now. I think with, with baby boomer generation and a lot of other things, it's becoming and I see it in the context of not just baby boomer generation, but I just think it's a really important thing to, that would add a lot of value to the point being made here, which is just that the firm, you know, I don't know whether you'd expect a small firm in that context to have that, um, but, you know, a way to kind of incorporate that concept in there as more preventative too, instead of like, you know, how to just handle this situation in these circumstances. Um, I thought in 269, 270, it was a little unclear about whether we were talking about informed written consent in those circumstances or not, because I think you list several things. I just had a question there, I guess. Um, the, the footnote three, um, I was wondering, and I was interested in what other people thought about this concept too. I, and this sort of relates to some of the issues that came up in the departure memo, but I, the concept of the fact that this, these, um, what the law firm's obligation would be to an attorney who's leaving and whether they'd have to tell clients about that, I just would, wondered if we needed to make sure that we said something about, you know, under 8.1, just making sure that they didn't say anything false or misleading. I think that's a treacherous area. I get the point being made about, um, that you wouldn't necessarily want to endorse uh, a um, allow a client to uh, an impaired attorney to represent the client or the firm without. But I just I, I I wonder, and I guess that opinion is saying specifically that the firm has a duty to to tell the client that there's this impairment if they were like the attorney was going to leave and and the client was interested in going with the attorney under footnote three. And so I just, I was, I mean, 8.1 is probably the wrong thing, but I just, I wondered, I'm sorry, 8.4, but I just wondered about the idea that, um, you know, kind of balancing that with this, I, they, how they, it's such a treacherous area. I just would want to make sure that firms weren't saying things like, you shouldn't go with that attorney. They're crazy or they're not, they're horrible or they're, you know, like making these comments. I don't want to feel like we're kind of endorsing that. I'm not saying firms would do that, but it just felt, it feels like a little bit of like, permission to disclose maybe personal things related to that you've already done a good job of covering that they have to be really careful about the privacy issues, you know, so I don't know. But that, that to your point, uh, I think the point is a good one that if, if you're, if you wait, if it's 30 days before trial and now you're dealing with it, then that's kind of a problem. And the point about having policies in place well before a crisis like that happens, I think is, is a, a very good observation um, and consistent with 5.1. In terms of uh, the size of the firm, I mean, I've always told lawyers that, you know, if, if it's more than you, if it's you and one other person, you need something in writing. You need to systematize your procedures. And sometimes even if it's only one lawyer, you probably need to sit down and write it out. But to the extent, if you're grappling with a problem like this 30 days before trial, where you're, you're, you know, do you have to tell a client? I mean, it seems to me 
we should encourage firms of all sizes to, to, to contemplate having some kind of policy like this in effect and, and everybody on notice of what the policy is well before any crisis occurs. And, you know, and the, you know, having to tell the client, well, this lawyer is impaired and, and can't go forward with the trial 30 days before trial. I mean, it seems to me it's that's the barn door has already been closed and the horse is long out. Yeah, and this is sort of like that that, that footnote three is kind of like the um, related to the talking about the duty to communicate and it would extend even if the attorney leaves as like sort of that side note. Anyway, I, I don't know. I just was kind of wanted to throw that idea out there. I'm not sure that I'm providing a very a great way to, to navigate that that particular point, but I just wanted to put it out there. Um, I think that the, yeah, I, I again made a note on 302, that paragraph there, just that the firm policies for hand, handling, evaluating wellness committee, you know, would uh, be helpful in that section too, if we could kind of discuss that there. And there's a couple places I just think if the firm had policies, that would be really helpful for the attorney to know what to do. Um, and then, uh, Yeah, okay. I don't buy license laws. So what I can do to help is uh, my notes on page, what well, lines 127 through 129, we have the signs of impairment. Just, do we, can we back that? Can we, can we cite to something? Some source? I don't, I don't what do you mean? My uh, opinion isn't sufficient. <laughs> okay. Well, inexplicable, inconsistent direction. I've I've seen a lot of that. <laughs> it's not necessarily a sign of impairment. Um, it's just okay. Let's see. Also, on one forty-seven through one fifty-three, we have a site to an obvious proposition. But I was wondering if. There weren't some California authorities on that. Maybe some state bar disciplinary uh, proceedings, because people frequently say that the reason why I failed to do the following is because I have an alcohol problem, divorce, whatever. And so I think there must be case. Look, there, there must be state bar court opinions that say that's just a mitigating factor that doesn't relieve you of your obligation. There's authority in terms of uh, under the stand discipline standards for what constitutes when that kind of thing can be mitigating. Typically, it's mitigating when it's causally connected to the misconduct. That causation is attested to by an expert witness. And three, the lawyer shows that the, either the problem has been fixed. Or the problem is substantially in our control. So there's quite a few cases to discuss that standard but, and apply but, that standard. But those are mitigating factors. As a mitigating factor, right. right. You know, but when, when but it, not as a defense. What's well, never a defense. Right, right. It's never a defense. Right. At best, it's a mitigating factor. The, the, the mens rea for a rule violation is so minimal. You were conscious when you you weren't sleepwalking when you did it. Um, that no, it's never a defense. Um, and I just David, do you have some uh, sites that you can give? The yeah, I can find I can yeah. find some citations for that. Yeah, I mean, every, every time I read the Daily Journal and see people being bounced out or they go on probation or yeah. they, excuse me, they're suspended. Yeah. If they talk about mitigating factors, but it never helps. Right? But I think there's got to be a lot of law on this, or a lot of state bar courts. No, there's a lot of there's a quite a bit of case law on, on the mitigation factors. Okay. Um, and I don't what on lines one fifty six, we have his or her. Do we need to do that? Do we have have we decided on a convention ever on this committee? I just think his or her is antiquated. I would just say the lawyer is antiquated. Yeah. yeah. Um, just wondered at 164 if you introduce rules 5.1 or 5.2 for the first time, do you want a full site? Um, not, uh, not a big deal. Um, let's see. Page, excuse me, line 
276, the impaired lawyer is a litigator in that scenario. And that, that was a new one on me. I, 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 I could be, I could learn something I didn't know. Because federal court never ceases to surprise me or scare me. But if you're on the pleadings in a federal court case and you seek to, you, you have to, even though your firm remains on the case, you have to, you've got to file something? To yeah, take you your have name? counsel of record. Oh, okay. In state court, I've, it's a little. Right. I'm sure I've complied. more vague. I to. <laughs> Let me say that. Um, but do you want, I just wondered about a site for that. I don't, I don't know sure. this. If, if you want to warn people about that. Um, I, on footnote three, um, which Dan talked about, is I thought, well, we're just saying that's what the ABA says. Do we agree with the ABA? Do we have our own source of authority for that? Because it is a. Where are you, Matt? Footnote oh, three. Okay. I'll look again. So in that scenario, the client, the impaired attorney leaves and takes the client with them. Your duty to the client continues even to a former client. The ABA seems to, I guess that's what they say, but I. Well, I think the other issue I was going to raise with related to that is I think some of that opinion, although I haven't read that opinion, is premised on that idea that they have model rule 893, right? Right. Which is mentioned yeah. twice in your opinion. I don't think you mentioned twice, but we obviously don't have 8.3. And I wonder if some of that analysis relates to their obligation and duty to report impairment, where we clearly don't have that. And not just we don't not that we don't have it, we like chose not to adopt it, right? So I think we need to say that more strongly that we, okay. we're you know, we have obviously had an opportunity recently to amend our rules and we did not adopt that rule. But I don't know, but I just wonder if that's part of that the stronger language. So it's just a it's it's quite an issue. Because yeah. because you see that happening, an older partner leaves and takes their favorite clients with them, and you're oh my god, what's going to happen next? And there's this ABA foot footnote in here, and I, I we okay. might want to try to grab that one by the horns and decide what our position is. Okay. Um, and then it, it does bring up what do you is what are your duties to a former client? Well, it, I guess it's, it's maybe we don't need to deal with that because here it's they're, they're departing clients, so they're you know they're not quite out the door yet. Well, they are right. client at the moment that they're that you learn that you're they're leaving. They're still a client, exactly. And yeah, and, and you know something bad's about to happen to yeah. them. So you, so I guess that'd be artificial. Well, they're a former client. You don't have to do anything. So I think you have to do something. Uh, okay. Okay. But but good luck. Um, so on three twenty six to three thirty one, I think that's an indented quote. Three twenty six. Is, is that a quote? Because there's a yeah, yeah there's a colon, a right? Um, I think I have one more. That's four seventy five through four eighty. Line 477, unlike scenario one, where firm management may act, this responsibility falls entirely upon attorney in scenario two. And that's because in scenario two, there is no, there is no firm management. Correct. Right. Or, or it's the impaired lawyer, essentially. Right, right, right. That's it. Those, those are my comments. Thank, thank you thank for you your bill. Um, I did, or I have to go. Okay. Um, no, it was actually more directed to Dina. But if there's other comments from anyone else who's left, yeah, I just had like two more things to finish. And is that okay? And then we, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, on, uh, I think I was just going to say in footnote four, the beginning of footnote four, you talk about that ABA opinion, and and one of the things that come out of that is that. Number one, to adopt measures to prevent an impaired attorney from violating ethical obligations. So that's consistent with the policies. And so I think 
if we're going to, you know, sort of follow that to some extent, that opinion, then that should obviously not be in the footnote and be more consistent with the, what we talked about. Um, and at, I had a little trouble kind of following the when scenario one and scenario two were being discussed um, in like line 270, sorry, 372. I, or 373, I think that we're talking about scenario one again there, but it doesn't specifically say. I think some of that kind of, um, I think it could be just like tightened up a little bit. With that. Okay. Um, I think a lot of, there's a lot of really good things in there, and um, it's a lot of really, I mean, it's much needed <laughs> opinion, and it's going to be really helpful. Um, I think those are my comments there's others I can email them there. Okay. Thank you. I think organization in one spot might be to look at what um, was done within the opinion about the um, advice on how to have counsel, you know, the one that Mary Galton was the lead on. Because there you had the three scenarios and they were, you know, and basic I guess what I think is it might be better to go through everything under scenario one, one and then and everything then, under two. And then under the two, but you won't have to do say. You'll say most of these are the same as in one, but here are the differences in some small parts. Mm -hmm. That, I, I would strongly would urge that. Um, my main thought is that I think that the opinion really could use, particularly the way the law is laid out, The it's not very well organized, it seems to me. I mean, I think what you want to do is have all of the sort of individual duties or core duties to the client, right? That's the first thing, is the core duties to the client. Then there's the question of the relative roles of supervisors and subordinates, and or a manager's supervisors and subordinates. And you don't really have supervisors in there, which you probably should, because supervisors' obligations are different than managers'. Managers' obligations are to have procedures in place, right? Supervisors' obligations are to actually do something, right? And so it feels to me like you want to lay it out. Here's mm. the basic things. The client needs to be competently represented. They need to be informed of significant developments. Whatever the list is, the sort of basic things that flow to the client, then 5.1, 5.2, 5 5.3, then, then discuss the, uh, the firm scenario, then discuss the individual scenario. Okay. Something like that. I think that would be more, I would read more, I think it would be more understandable exactly where you're going. And I agree with Dina. I think the ABA opinion, right, unless we really disagree with any of it, which we do to the extent that it requires reporting, you know, under 8.3. Uh, but the rest of it probably all ought to be congenial, and we ought to be making more use of it to, be, to bolster our conclusions, particularly since so many of the firms, the big firms that we're aiming at, are going to be subject to the ABA regime anyway. So we're really trying to stitch something together that shows that the ABA regime and our regime compatibly together. Okay. Eric, I had one quick comment or question just to follow up on Dina's points about whether there are resources, additional resources being made available to address the situation. The opinion calls for that, but it really doesn't describe how to do that in much detail. And I went and looked up what's on the state bar website and under the lawyer assistance program, they have self-analysis tests for anxiety, depression, and drug and alcohol abuse. They make it clear that they make available free consultation, education. And then there's another state bar um, publication, I wasn't aware of this, a wellness guide for senior lawyers and their families, friends, and colleagues. They talk about mild cognitive impairment and a whole bunch of other things. So 
just for your consideration, if you thought they were useful, I thought that might fill in the gap in terms of particularly scenario two, where you have either a solo practitioner who doesn't have a, uh, a, a, an attorney or, or a committee within a larger firm that could lend assistance to this, especially for that, you know, that person trying to, trying to deal. Well, I guess it would be at least two. It would be at least two or more people in the small firm dealing with something like this. But just something to consider, because I, I was impressed when I looked, found this stuff last night on the website. It might be something you want to include in a footnote or somewhere in the opinion. Yeah, I think that would be helpful. Well, it, it, it certainly advocates for the welfare of all the persons involved, the client and the impaired attorney, but it also, I think, helps in terms of liability risk and management to the extent that the attorney can demonstrate that they've enacted responsible actions in, in an attempt to address this. It can't, can't hurt that function either. Mm -hmm. um, so I only have a couple of comments, Eric. Um, one is um, when we talk uh, when we talk about um, the uh, the attorney's um, obligations, particularly, I guess we're on scenario two. I'm on what I'm I'm in sort of line 357 that portion of the opinion and ultimately we conclude that you know if you do want you take one steps one two three whatever and if if nothing's working you consider um, withdrawing from the reputation and I just I really you know first of all I was sure like well what does that mean does that mean quit your job um, and uh, I guess particularly where this we're in scenario two, so that would mean, yeah, I guess, I mean, I'm not really sure what that means. When you're a junior attorney, you're on a two-person trial team, the, the, the main guy is a mess, but he's not willing to admit it. You can't get anyone to listen. You do what? Well, and that's something that we've struggled with. Yeah. Uh, and I'm trying to recall now, I know that it was, that issue has been raised before. Yeah, yeah. Um, in terms of what is a satisfactory resolution or what counsel can we provide in that regard, I, I think that's that's probably it. But I say that only by default because okay. I don't know of a more satisfactory response. Um, well, well, maybe if we take out the trial thing. If Period, like the 30, like 60, 30, whatever it is, way, and just maybe it hasn't been set for trial. I mean, isn't some of the withdrawal issues and prejudice kind of relate to the timing of like, here's this urgent event? And I mean, maybe that's not what you're dialing into about the with, with, cause that is an option, but it seems like it'd be much less prejudicial to the client if there was, you had an opportunity to think about, like, okay, we're in this situation, we're a small firm, the main person who's going to try it isn't. Can we do something? Can we get co counsel? Do we need to withdraw in a way that wouldn't be prejudicial? I don't know if that's a better thing not to have that trial. It, it, it may well be because that does afford, I, I mean, it doesn't completely address Amy's concern in that nobody's listening to the, the subordinate lawyer. Right. But at least it raises the prospect of affiliating with other competent counsel. It, it affords, I think, potentially more options than might apply okay. if in particular, we're talking okay. about a scenario where it's 30 days before trial, it's a small firm, the uh, senior lawyer is non-responsive to your concerns. I think that does create a false sense of urgency yeah. and limits the options, if you will, of the subordinate lawyer. So okay. I, I'll explore deleting the time-sensitive nature of the, the factual scenario and see what that does to the opinion overall. I, I like it conceptually, but I need to think about it yeah, a bit more. Yeah. 
Yeah. Or maybe the matter was just set for trial. I mean, I don't know, but something where it's less I don't know. I mean, I don't, when I, and I've worked on this now for, been in the league on this for a while, I've never, it, as we've altered the focus, it has been increasingly less important yeah. that trial was and right. yeah. And, yeah. and while I like your suggestion of making it a bit farther out so as to permit some greater flexibility, I don't know that it changes the fundamental precept, which is if the subordinate lawyer needs to enlist the assistance of other counsel, is other counsel going to be willing to step into this morass? Even if it's 90 days away, I don't know. I mean, you can raise that issue, but um, let me play with that and see what makes the most sense. And yeah, I gotta go. Bye, David. Gotta go We're uh, going to yeah, wrap up. Do you got to go? Okay. I've got to catch a train. So. All right. Let's call this a great meeting. Thank you, everybody. See you in Thank April. You. I just sent you a memo. Okay. Hold the train. Great. Okay. So you can uh, send it to you. I sent to you and to Drew with copies to Andrew and me. I, I, I text, uh, uh, uh.